Unite and Win episode 10. This is the long awaited, highly anticipated Dan Cuban episode. He is a wizard amongst men and a brilliant machinist and tattooer and now friend. I learned a lot spending time with him for a few days and um, even collected a cool tattoo and got to see his machine shop and talk tattoos and uh, pick his brain and, and hopefully this interview um, brings you some value and able to do a little bit of the same. Without further ado, this is the Dan Cuban interview. Approach like I'm just right. tattooing, like I'm just drawing my sketch pad, you know. Yeah. So how'd you get your first tattoo? Well, I went to a um, motorcycle convention thing. It's like a, a biker rally, and they had a bunch of like biker tattooers there. And I just turned 18, and um, we're going around like I'm gonna get a fucking tattoo. I think so I'm was it the game it. plan, or you're just feeling? No, I was just like we walked in, and then there's like strippers and like and fucking <laughs> bikes and 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 um, and just like. Is cool. Like I never seen that kind of stuff before. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm here. You know, I yeah, made yeah, it. Yeah. And um, and I went in and we're looking through Flash. And then um, I was into BMX really big when I was a kid, mm -hmm. up until about 25. But um, uh, I saw a deal and it was like a bicycle chain. And I was like, at the time that was 95, 1995. Um, I'm like, I want to. I think a bicycle chain armband would be really cool. Fuck yeah. But um, <laughs> so I got a bicycle chain armband. And, um, do you still have it? No, is that's, that's another story. I mean, I didn't, I covered it up because it didn't look right. So when I got it, I was like, how much for a bicycle chain armband? And the guy's like $120. And I'm like, well, what if it just went like most of the way around? And he goes, oh, I'll do it for 80. I'm like, oh, I'll do the $80 one. Yeah. And then, um, uh, then I, later I joined the Marines and then I, my arms grew like twice the size, you know, I just uh. became a you know, a Marine. Um, yeah. And, um, <laughs> then I had like a little strip of bicycle chain and it, it was, you know, straight. So there, you couldn't just like add more to it. It was oh, all, it right. was all funky. And I, I felt it was weird. And instead of just saying, okay, just get another tattoos around it and just kind of, that's it. Um, I actually really liked the tattoo and it was a part of who I was, you know, um, but I ended up getting it covered. I went back to the place where I, I came back home, home on leave. Um, and I found, I had the card from Thunder Art Tattoo. That was a shot. <laughs> Thunder Art. Yeah, and it had like a castle with like a wizard, I think, Sick. in the background. But um, I went back and they're like, I don't even know who that was. And it's like, what do you look like? Well, you kind of had a beard and kind of fat. Everyone you know, here has a beard like, and fat. <laughs> dark, dark hair with a beard and a bunch of shitty tattoos. I don't know. Um, you know <laughs> like, I think it was you. I'm like, no, that wasn't me, man. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, so they didn't have the flash book. They didn't have the stencil anymore to like get more going around. So... The guy like drew on some like tribal um, flames because I didn't know what tribal was. That was like when I started seeing stuff like I want those like black shapes. You know, could you do something with that like pointy black shape and maybe we could just cover it with that. And so he drew this this thing around, and um, then it, I was like, ah, oh, fuck that. That even looks like more shit. Mm. And then like later, that same tattoo kind of built up on this other stuff that was like even more shit. Um, just kept just, piling. Yeah, up. I was like, God damn it! I should just stop. I should have like just let it go and just kept getting good tattoos rather than trying to turd polish stuff. It's and, like uh, that, like that, uh, like you said that, that shit sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. When life gives you shit, you make a shit sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So where was the shop at? Was that here in Kansas? Uh, yeah, I was on the Kansas side. Um, we're in Missouri right now, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, Kansas city, Missouri. So is, is out off there, uh, off kind of off the beaten path, but it's still in the city kind of, mm. but, and so from then on, like, did you know you wanted to be tattooed? Was that something that was like, you know, but by the time I got my first tattoo, I looked down at my body and I was like, I'm empty. Mm. I like, I had like this sense of like completion and emptiness at the same time. Like, what am I going to do? What, what are all this other space, you mm. know? And, and, uh, then I naturally just started looking like, well, now I got this and it's going to frame in this and I want, um, start piecing it out. Yeah. But I really kind of, you know, I was going in the military and like, you know, career wise, like I don't, you know, don't, um, I can't just be covered in tattoos, but I definitely was like thinking like my next tattoo, I like drew it out. Like my next tattoo is going to be this thing here and this mm. thing. And I was like kind of mapping out all the tattoos I was going to have, you know, was wanting the tattoo even, even like a thought at that point. Uh, you know, so in the Midwest here, um, I never saw good tattoos. 
Mm-hmm. It was just like stupid shit. And people always got stupid stuff. And then when I, I would always draw, but people would be like, hey, draw me this thing. Draw me a Kansas City Chiefs logo or something. And I'm like, right. I don't want to draw your stupid idea. Yeah. Like, I just want to draw my shit. And, and um, I don't, everybody got stupid tattoos and I, I didn't want to be stuck doing stupid shit off the wall or, mm-hmm. or whatever, like gecko anklets and, and right. stuff. So I never thought like, man, I don't like drawing for people already. So I definitely don't want to like do that as my job. Mm. But to fast forward, as I got older um, and started realizing that I loved it when I was good at something and I had a skill and I could make people happy doing something I was good at. And so when I was younger, I was just selfish. It's all just about me, mm-hmm. you know. And as I got older, I started realizing, man, I, I like being good at something and then making somebody's day doing it for them. Right. And so if that means I'm, um, draw, you know, draw an American eagle with a flag, then then I'll do it. But um, but then I'm gonna make it look cool. Like I'm, my job is to make some corny thing look awesome, and right. then. So that becomes the the challenge, you know, it's like, how do I take, how do I do this thing and make it my own and make it engaging? Right. So like, so then, so, so you go to the Marines and you you kind of slow on getting tattooed and you, that's where you got like started doing machining and stuff like that the first time. No, well, I went to the Marines as an open contract pretty much. And then they, based on my, uh, ASVAB score, which is like the score you take an Mm -hmm. ASVAB test to figure out where, what, what you're good at. Um, they made me a small arms repairman. So I was fixing M16s and nine millimeters all the way up to 50 caliber machine guns. Um, mm-hmm. And I got in and I was like, I like, guns are cool, but like really like the Marine Corps, like the military kind of took the fun of guns out. Mm-hmm. Cause like you go to, you go to, you go to boot camp and you think, oh yeah, co- this is like college. And like, this is like making me a better person or I'm going to be st- strong. I'm going to be able to do a hundred pushups, you know, <laughs> stupid, you know. But then you go there and like, your job is to kill people. We're training you to be a murderer and you're going to kill fucking people. That's your fucking job to kill a fucking enemy. And um, you're like, oh shit. And you go out and you're not shooting guns. Oh yeah, we're shooting machine guns. No, you're training to fucking kill people. And this is serious. And you got people yelling at you and it's high stakes. And, um, and so I kind of took the, the fun out of it. Like real, real shit. And I kind of realized like I was brainwashed for a little bit, like, yeah, let's after boot camp, I'm like, yeah, I don't fucking kill people. And then they're like, what the fuck am I thinking? Like, I don't right. want to kill people. Right. Um, not unless they kick my dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, uh, uh, anyways, I was in small arms repair and I didn't really like guns, mm-hmm. but then I kind of got to where, like, this is kind of cool. There's like things with springs that cycle and like moving parts and stuff out of metal. And shit kind of broke, and then I was figuring out, I started to understand how it all went together. Mm. And so I started figuring out, like, how to fix stuff. And, you know, we mostly what we did is we replaced parts. But then we started running low on parts, and uh, we kind of had to figure out, like, do these little hacks, like file this trigger hammer down and do this stuff, and then it'll, it'll work again. Um, and so I kind of got into, like, modifying the um, right. some of the, the springs and stuff to, like, so the the trigger wouldn't slip on an M16. So it like once the trigger wears out, it'll start double firing and it'll still be like an automatic rifle at that point. Mm. And um, I figured out if I bent this little hammer spring around, um, it would keep the whole mechanism tightened in and then it wouldn't slip. And so we solved all the problems that are worn out rifles by bending this hammer spring down in a way like this little leg on the spring. And nobody was complaining because it was a huge problem and we couldn't fix it because we had no we had no budget to, to buy new parts and, right. um, and not until the next fiscal year. But then somebody's rifle blew up and it wasn't my fault. Like, uh, whatever happened, the, the kid's rifle blew up in his face and then they inspected the rifle. The first thing they do is they take the rifle, they go and inspect it and just check everything. And they're like, what is this deal with this hammer spring? Like, it's all bent up all weird. And like, oh, Cuban, uh, he uh, he was saying like he's he's been doing this to like because it, it helps it prevent from mm-hmm. from this slip and like we do not modify firearms we do not that is not your job your job is to replace parts mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like, right. but um anyways I started looking at that and I really got into what if it was made like this what if you know and and I saw I started seeing. I want to be like making stuff out of metal. And, um, that's, and I didn't know what that was called being a machinist at the time. I knew I like had all these ideas for stuff. Like, I had ideas for bicycles and like, I want to do all this. Like I want to have a bicycle company and make bicycle parts originally. Um, so I needed to learn how to make stuff out of metal. 
and so once I got out of the Marines, I was going to, I was going to moonlight to be, um, like go to school at night to learn machining and stuff. And I ended up talking to an air force recruiter, um, on accident and he said, you should join the air force. And I'm like, oh, this is already in the, I'm not into the military. And he goes, right. well, it's not that the air force isn't the real military, you know? <laughs> but, um, uh, He's like, I want to be a machinist and I want to be a welder. I want to learn machining and welding. We have a job that's both machining and welding. I want to do TIG welding, like like the precision stuff to make bicycles. And he's like, yeah, it's TIG welding. We do TIG welding. We'll teach you like machining and TIG welding. Mm. It's like, man, I could work a construction job all day. And then I could moonlight, you know, like go to classes at night to learn this for the next four years. Mm. Or I could get pay, a sergeant's pay to get paid to go to school in Maryland for four months and come out as a machinist and a welder was like, and get paid $4,000 a month to do it. I'm like, I think I'll do that route. Why not? You know? And so I went and I got the schooling and that was the first school that I ever did great. And I was like the, the valid Victorian of, of the metal, the metals technology course, you know, I mean, I I was so into it. Like this is everything I ever wanted to learn in life is like, um, making stuff out of metal and every single thing they taught me, I was already thinking like how I was going to make bicycle parts. What, how would this pertain to all this stuff that I already been thinking of and all these ideas I had. So everything they taught me made complete sense. And I was absorbing it all just because it'd been stuff I've been dying to learn how to do. Right. Trip out. So, so like that's crazy. So how long were you in the air force for after that? So I started off in the Marines and I was in there for a four year enlistment. Right. And then I was, I signed up for the air force to get a, it was like a $5,000 bonus. I had to sign up for six years. Whoa. And, um, at about my four year point, I realized, man, I don't, I love machining. I love my job, but I was, I was getting higher up in rank to where I wasn't even supposed to do my job. I was supposed to tell other people how to do their job. Mm. And like, so it's like the blind leading the blind. Like, at that point you already learned what you want to learn with the, yeah, I, I got, I got where I wanted, but I still was wanting to learn to be a better machinist. And like, I was still just scratching the, the tip, which yeah. I still am. I've been a machinist for over 20 years and um, I'm still scratching the surface. I right. still like, I'm still like a noob to it. I feel like there's mm. so much stuff I still need to learn. Um, but anyways, I didn't want to be a machinist as a civilian because I didn't want to just be a button pusher, you know, in a, in a factory making the 10,000 of the same parts. Right. Um, but in the air force, it was a cool job because every single day it was, I was f- welding up a cracked trailer or I was uh, welding an engine uh, uh, an aircraft engine or I was um, making some weird bracket that they had to have because that jet had to fly that night and it was just cool like everything just came in you just had to make it and it, every day was kind of different and uh, mm. you never made more than five of the same parts you know wow, yeah. Um, but as I got out you know as I got more ranked they're like you you need to be the supervisor and you need to have these other guys doing this stuff and you kind of want to keep doing stuff I did and but it's like if I don't want to be a machinist as a civilian um, and I don't want to stay in the military cause like they just didn't value me like a free thinking individual. just doesn't get very far in the military. Right. Um, so I, I want to do something with art and I figured I had two years to get good at something before I got out. Um, Shit. and so at my four year point, I'm like, I need to, if I don't get out, I need to stay in for 20 because as at my 10 year point at that, right. at that point on uh, 20, you retire. Um, and so I decided, like, I don't, I want to do something with art and I don't want to use computers and I don't want to do advertising. You know, I don't want to be like a commercial, you mm. know, just write, making commercials or do anything. I just, and, um, my friends were like, you should, you should do tattoos, man. You're always drawing, you right. know, and I, I was drawing like panthers and skulls and hearts and so daggers. Was tattoo imagery. I was already into that. That was the stuff I drew like pencil and paper and like crude kind of punk rock images, you yeah. know? And, um, Finally, I was just like, you know what? I, I got to decide now. I'm at my four-year point. I got two years to get good at something. And I just woke up and I was like, I don't care what my, because I come from a pretty conservative family. I don't care what my family thinks. I don't care what my wife thinks anymore. I don't care if I'm going to get busted by the military for doing this. I didn't know if I, I would get in trouble for tattooing. I didn't, I don't know. And um, I'm just going to do it. And I, I sort of started reading everything and I went to um. I went to a few uh, tattoo shops and like, yeah, I'm looking for an apprenticeship. But, uh, you know, I want to start learning how to tattoo. And like the good shops, were like, 
Yeah, we're not. We're not looking for anybody. I'm just like this dude, like military guy, you know, like right, yeah. short hair and uh, and uh, no no visible tattoos or anything. And got this arm, man. Yeah, I got. <laughs> you see my tribal son on my shoulder, man. Like I, I know what's up. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so it was either that or I walked into this other shop and in Idaho. There's no, or at the time I don't know how it is now, but there's no. There's no regulation. The health department couldn't even come into a tattoo shop. Mm. And I go into this place, and it's like a, it's a tweaker shop, you know. And the dude's like meth mouth and everything, yeah, and he's yeah. like strung out looking. And and I'm like, yeah, I'm here to um, see about an apprenticeship. Like, I want to get into tattooing, and I don't know what to really do. And goes, look, I I do an apprenticeship for twenty five hundred dollars. It's half down, and then the other half, like once you once you finish your apprenticeship, and it's going to take six months. And I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at all the stuff he's doing. Like, they're, I totally know they're doing everything wrong already. It's yeah. just shitty. And then the, his wife, his, like, tweaker-looking prostitute wife, mm-hmm. um, comes up and goes, and they're smoking cigarettes inside. And they're like, phone call. And he just has his dirty glove on, you know, because he's right. tattooing. And he just grabs the phone with his dirty gloves, like, hello. And you know, just like, Fuck. this place is disgusting. And yeah. it was like, there's like, I'm only going to learn how to be a piece of shit if I, if I, if I went to the, he didn't want to look, he didn't look at a portfolio. He didn't want to see what, what do you got? Like, he was just, I want your money. Want that and, and, money. and funny thing is like six months later, like his shop had closed anyway. So, mm. but I just decided, shit, I have two years to do this. Um, I've already learned two pretty complex trades in the military from small arms repair to machining. I knew how to like crawl before to walk or, you know, walk before you run kind of a thing. So I knew like how to train myself and like do something like a crash course and get through something and be good in like three months, you know, and kind of absorb something and and get it down. Mm -hmm. Um, So... I went online and I found this home apprenticeship kit from, yeah. from Geo's Tat Shack. Oh, man. And, um, and so I ordered this stuff. And it was kind of was a rough start because I ordered it. And then like, like four weeks passed. And I, I'm like, I didn't have my, my stuff. What the hell, Geo? And then I call him and he's like, oh, what? And I'm like, yeah, I got my credit card number. I got the transaction thing right here that I paid. And he's like, oh. And so it finally went out like another week later. I got my, my kit. And I was like pulling stuff out. I'm like, what are these things? There's the, the tattoo machines, but I didn't know what they were. Like, what is this thing? And like, I was, like, I almost called them. Like, where's my where's my tattoo guns? You know, I don't know. Like, I didn't. Yeah. I was really curious to see what they looked like and everything. But um, it came with these DVDs, and I got it. Huck Spaulding's tattooing A to Z, yeah. and everything. And so I got all this stuff, and I just read it. I read it. Like, I read the book front page, front to back. Like, as soon as I got it, I just sat down and read the whole book. And I don't. I'm not a reader, but I just read that whole thing, and I went back and read it again. Um, trying to absorb it, and then I watched all the DVDs before I did anything. I watched, I watched, I read that book. I read, I watched all the DVDs from everything, and it was actually pretty good. It showed you how to make needles. It showed you how to tune a machine. Told you how to take apart a coil machine and respring it. I mean, yeah. it was, it, it was actually that, like yeah. not worthless information. Um, it, I mean, it wasn't like super groundbreaking, but it's just like here's how to cut your teeth doing tattoos. You know, you can you can kind of figure this out, and if you pay attention to it. I mean, it was, it was useful, it yeah. was useful knowledge, but, um, I did that and then I had some fake skin. So I was like drew and stuff and I kept showing my friends and I would draw like every day. Like I would just fill up a whole page. Like I would just draw, draw, draw and like look at stuff and like draw it and try to understand the imagery better. Um, and I was practicing like shading with colored pencils and I was, I was training myself and, um, uh, then I go and like get tattooed. And I kind of like really like pay attention to the guy mm. tattooing me, and like I listened to how his machine sounded, and like what volts he was running it on, and when he wasn't looking, I'd pick it up and feel the spring tension oh, and stuff, you know. Um, he'd go around the corner. I'm like, "What's this?" You know. Oh, um, so I got into it, and before I did my first tattoo, I actually because I was, you know, worked in a machine shop. I went and made like three tattoo machines. Like I was just really? making coils. I made like several coils. The sucky thing is I don't even have any of them put together just because mm-hmm. like I cannibalize that. Like I do this and I cannibalize it and then make something else and I just have shit all hacked up. But um, I made like three tattoo machines before I did my first tattoo. And then, um, but then when it con- came time to do my first tattoo, I just used the machines that I got from my kit. Yeah. You know, I, was, I want to make sure I had the real the real deal, my strong man and my, yeah. well, I forget what they're called. There's like the hammer, you know? <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I already taken those machines apart and resprung them too, and like just was playing with springs. And I Icon had the machine gun magazine out, so I went and bought the armature bars and all the springs from Icon and was playing with them. And I had a an old Icon power supply that would show all the duty cycle and all that. And I was like right. really trying to learn like how how to make it fast and slow. So I was super into the machines right from the get go. So did you know like coming into it that you were like gonna make machines like? Well, that was a side thought, and actually to back up. When I first, when I got to Idaho is when I, when I started seeing really cool, like actual like tattoos, like, like collector type tattoos. And so all of a sudden I was like really into tattoos. Like this is cool. And I was like, man, I could make that kind of stuff. I was looking at the stuff and I was like, I could probably make tattoo machines. And ever since I, I remember being in middle school and being like wondering, what is a tattoo machine? How does it cycle? How does it move this needle up and down? I remember looking at sewing machines. Like, is that how a tattoo machine works? Oh. Like, I didn't even know. And, you know, there's no Google at the time. There's no internet. So I didn't, um, I didn't even know. But I was kind of interest, always interested in it. Like, almost like I was born, like, my previous life was, like, tattooing. I don't know. Like, yeah. machines, like, or something. I was, I was so intrigued by, by tattoo machines. Uh, but when I got into tattooing, yeah, it's automatically, like, because before tattooing, I was into BMX, and I learned machining and welding just so I could make innovative bike parts. And then I broke my kneecap, and when I broke my kneecap after I had torn both ACLs already, I looked down, I was like 26, and I'm like, man, every time I fall, I'm going to the emergency room now. And I, I kind of had this huge depression. Um, it's like, that was my life. And I was going to have a bicycle company. I was learning all the stuff. I was going to get out and start making bicycles. So um, before I broke my kneecap, I took that time, like while I was healing from an ACL surgery, to make a jig, and I made my own bike frame. I made the stem. I made the seat post. I made all the stuff. I pretty much made my own BMX bike. Uh, I can show you. I still have the. I still have it. Um, I made it. I went out and rode like the first time out riding it. Um, the the um, the uh, the doctor said, "Oh, you could probably go ride your bike." And I ended up breaking my kneecap in half. Just riding. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, wasn't doing anything crazy. I just kind of put my foot down and it buckled my kneecap and broke it in half. <sighs> That's heavy. And I looked down at my broken kneecap and like my, my knee was like swollen up like this and it was separated. It was the creepiest thing. I was like, oh shit. Gnarly. Um, and I looked and I was like riding with this like douchebag kid. He's like 17, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm like 26. I'm riding with some little punk kid he's just a compulsive liar but i was like hanging out with him just because i needed somebody to ride with kind of like kind of like you would hang out with like scumbags when you're like a drug addict you know like because like this is the worst people but like they got this thing that i want you know they got this we do this thing together and um so anyways i was like i'm over it i gotta figure something else out so i was kind of doing music a lot like i i I play music i i I got a stand-up bass and i was doing all this stuff like i could probably make money like i could probably make a living being a stand-up bass player like there's always needed you know doing that but more so than anything i just had ideas for like whether it was drawing or anything like like music it's all kind of the same stuff i've always been making something making something and like writing songs and doing stuff and um so it's into music but i was like man there's no there's no future in this and my wife's definitely gonna like not good for a for a wife when you have a wife and two kids to, right. to play music um so that was really wasn't going to go anywhere it's just fun it's just an outlet you know but um that's when i got into tattooing but um all the stuff that i learned about making bicycles totally pertain to tattoo machines and even oh. more so because there's even more like springs and everything from like firearms all that information and all the stuff that i learned about firearms and bicycles and um aircraft parts and 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 metallurgy and heat treating and and every single thing i just lumped it right on into tattoo machines um but i still like i was just making stuff and i didn't have anything substantial because i don't even know how to like if if it was me or the machine when there's a problem is is this so um so i kind of wanted to wait until i was actually knew how to tattoo before i started taking it Mm. serious yeah, because you don't know what direction you're really building them right. in. Yeah. But so anyways, um, when I started tattooing, um, finally, like, my friends saw, like, um, the, my, my tattoo skin, you know, my thick skin. Like, right. I think you could do that. I want these nautical stars on my chest. And maybe can you do some nautical stars on your thick skin so I can kind of see, like, how your lines are looking. Mm-hmm. And I did. I'm like, I think you're ready. I think you could tattoo me. So my first tattoo... Um, was two symmetrical too. nautical stars 
on each side of his of my friend's uh, mm. collar, like right here, had a line up, and I'm like, um, I'm putting the stencils on, and he goes, I don't know who's shaking more, me or you, because we're both like, fuck, Whoa. I can't believe we're doing this, and I um, I pulled it off. It was the most fuck. It was the most stressful thing, you know, just like, oh my god, I can't believe I was I was doing it, and um, believe it or not, they actually they actually were decent and um i fixed him up about a, like a, a year and a half into tattooing and i fixed him up and and i seen the guy um you know after they've been like 13 years old and i saw him and it's like oh shit. yeah they're still there cool. wow but um so yeah i uh, started doing like my friends and then um i did about 15 tattoos out of my house and then i started like tattooing people i didn't really know out of my house and it's it getting it's kind of creepy this is getting kind of scratchery feeling and uh, i didn't like it um even though I, I took a whole room i took out the carpet i put in a solid surface floor i bought an autoclave i had an ultrasonic i was i would when i, I was so clean when i first started um that i would go through a box of gloves for every tattoo i would like Whoa. touch i touch this glass you know with with my glove, even though I wasn't touching skin, but I would go and mm. stitch my glove out. Like I touched the ink cap, I touched the bag of the of the, the ink caps were in, and I better wear a glove and I better take it off. And I was just, yeah, a glove every tattoo, uh, a box of gloves for every tattoo. Damn. But um, uh, eventually I just, I went into the shop. It was another scratcher shop, you know, because in Idaho you don't. But it was at least it was a tattoo shop, and I, was, right. I went in. And I, I I was hanging out and. Um, I showed the guy like, here's what I know. Here's the machines I've made, and here's all the knowledge that I know. Here's the tattoos I've done. I'm in the military. I have quite a few of my military buddies, you know, like a military people, because the base is kind of small. Like they all want tattoos from me. Mm -hmm. um, can I tattoo them here? I don't want to tattoo at my house. It's like, yeah, um, there's your station, sixty forty. Come on in, you know. Wow. And uh, I started tattooing there, and. I was like the premier artist, but like I've done like 15 <laughs> tattoos in my life. And I was like the, the, the guy, like I was the most knowledgeable person in their shop. And, Check um, out. uh, so like this is not good. And so this other dude, um, from Boise, um, he came, he came to our town in mountain home. Um, and, uh, and he was kind of a big shot and he's kind of like, he kind of walked with a swagger he's, he's, a. uh, He's a total gangster, you know, kind of dude. And, um, but he like he was he was using mags and like seven liners and like like at the time like oh shit, you use a seven liner or seven mag, you know what's up, you know? Yeah. Hell yeah, like this guy knows. And uh, um, it's like I I would rather be in a considered an apprentice, and I want to be telling people I'm an apprentice instead of being like the premier artist at a shop where right, I don't even don't know what the hell I'm below doing. You you know you're trying to try to learn something. Yeah, so I helped the guy build his shop up and everything, and then um. And I just started tattooing there, and I mean, he, I just would clean his tube. I'd st sterilize the tubes and 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 little stuff like that, and they kind of helped clean up. But um, I was full time active, active duty military, and then tattooing full time at night. I get off, okay. depending on the shift I worked, because we did twenty four hour coverage for my job. So, whatever shift I worked, I would just work another eight hours off of that. So I'm working nine hours there and then eight hours, seven or eight hours. At That's the cool. It's shop. flexible and you can kind of do that. Yeah. Um, so I was tattooing full time and military full time and somehow like somehow my marriage still stayed together. I was going to say, a, how's by your a, wife and all this? By a thread. She, she toughed it out. Not yeah. me. Like she, she, she was the one like did, didn't kind of, that didn't give up. And I kind of was just stressed out, you know, and like, did she just think it was like an annoying hobby or did she see any, no, like, she saw the, 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 she's like, well, I mean, you can make, you can make a living. I can, I was definitely could make enough money to, to be already what I was already making in the military. Right. I, I know I can make four grand a month, you know, doing, doing tattoos. Yeah. Um, but, um, no, I, I definitely, I was just, I, I got to do this. I need like, two years i need to be good at this because if i get out like i have a wife and two kids to support like i can't just start over again i can't mm -hmm. i can't kiss somebody's ass for for three years hoping to like get an apprenticeship and then you know i've already been somebody's i've already been humbled through the military and through boot camp and all that stuff so um but anyways i was working under this guy and is mainly meant that i cleaned his tubes and then um and stuff um and took shit right. and then the one thing he did be like he was He's like, you think you're good? You suck. Your lines suck. Um, you're shading. It's okay. Your ideas are pretty good. My ideas are better, but you're, but uh, that's good. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely humbling because like you, you're acting like you're awesome and you know what you're doing and, and you mm. still suck and your lines need work. 
And it was like, you actually need to go and buy some machines instead of using the shit that you made. And then he told me two things is kind of, kind of fucked up. And I still kind of hold it over his head is he said, you need to quit drawing your own tattoos and you need to quit fucking with those machines. And you just need to get some good machines and spend like $300 on some machines and get some good ones and start, start drawing the stuff off the, off the wall. Mm -hmm. And and if the, the thing is, is the clients by that time, Miami Inc is just out and like nobody was flash on the wall it's not cool anymore you know and so it's like people were expecting so i wasn't gonna be the guy who goes in the back room and and traces something and then goes and say oh look at this thing i just whipped up and drew you know i just Mm. i was expected to to draw stuff and 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 do it and like draw out of my head and like draw without reference and it's kind of like that like um let's uh draw this bird and and just draw it like off the dome piece you would say you know like just, just do it and uh and so i just kind of had to get used to just drawing like that and um drawing on the spot with the client watching and mm-hmm. um i like doing that though i didn't i think that's part of the, that's the best way yeah i think it's the when the client sees how hard you worked or like how like or either how hard you worked or how skilled or how easy you made it one of the either way it's really cool to see the whole thing just kind of come They're together. part of it you know yeah and they understand why like you know if they email you saying they want this in a banner and they see you sketching it and it's not really working and you do an alternative idea they they they're with it because they saw in real time why their idea sucked and why this idea came to fruition better. Yeah. You know? Or they'd see it like when I put it up on their arm, like that's why I didn't do the tail that way because I'm trying to go in here and you got this weird curve on your deltoid and I'm just trying to, I'm trying to hug that line. I'm trying to make sense of your body because it's, Mm -hmm. I mean, it could look good on paper or it could look bad on paper, but look good on skin or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I was just drawing my own tattoos and he's just, I kind of took his advice. I, I never quit drawing my own stuff. I'm like, I'm, I I do art. Like the reason I got into tattooing was I thought like I could actually once I started seeing collector tattoos, like I actually have something to bring to the table and like I can draw original stuff and I wanted a, a way to do art that um like I need people to commission me to do art, you know, to mm. draw stuff because I draw the same three things and I didn't I I'm over it and then I'm bored with drawing, you know. Mm. So I need something to kinda elude me a little and um so people's ideas kind of force me to draw and then i enjoy it you know so doing tattoos makes ensures that i'm continuing to grow as an artist right because otherwise it would just go to the wayside um so like tangent. <laughs> <laughs> so like in doing that so so are you still how long were you so you're doing that for two more years what happened when you got out um so I got out of the military. They tried to give me orders to Korea. And then they said, you're going to also have to extend or re-enlist to go to Korea. I'm like, actually, I'm not going to extend or re-enlist. I'm, I'm getting out. I'm just going to finish my, my sentence. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, they're like, actually, you have 10 days. Whoa. And they, they're kind of like going to try to break the news to me. Like, How far yeah. is this into your two years? Um, I had six months left on my, on okay. my enlistment. So I've been tattooing for a year and a half at that so point. So you're ready. You're waiting to get out I was, anyways. I was already making more, like, I just had like pockets full of money. I was like, cause I was like working two full-time jobs and I like, I paid off, I bought a car and I paid off the whole car within like, within like six months, you know? And, yeah. um, so I was making good money, you know, and it's like, I don't even need this shit anymore. I don't need, I don't need. So it was, it was cool. It wasn't like too scary. Getting no, out. they, they, when they told me, it was like, they're going to break the news to him. And they told him like, really? Fuck yes. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready to be done with this and, um, yeah. start my new life. Uh, so then I started my new life and I kind of self-destructed, um, getting out. Oh, I don't have to get drug tests anymore. You know, it's like, Mm. I was smoking weed a lot, and um, the thing is with me, my, with um, the way my brain works, like weed just it, it'll put me in a psychosis. You know, like I just right. I would go insane, and so I was kind of going crazy, and and I squandered a lot of my money. I went like I just, but I also kind of at the same time was getting all kinds of crazy ideas, and like yeah. I think that my my original sidewinder concept was I was kind of in a psych, psychotic moment brought on by too much too much weed. Whoa. Uh, out. yeah it's like i didn't sleep for like seven days like oh, maybe some more weed will make me sleep and like no like weed just like turns my brain on and i can't shut it off so um but anyways um so were you using when you were tattooing like you had your two first geo machines you're fucking around making coils like when the transition of popularity of rotary start to come upon like were you 
trying to mess with rotaries or sing what so, it could be? So here's the other thing. Um, after I'd done a couple tattoos with my with my janky little coils. Um, janky geos. Janky geos, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> with Huck on your side. <laughs> uh, after I did a couple with those, I went online. Because I was, I was hearing about rotaries, and I found on eBay Neotat. Yeah. And I called... I called him Ray Webb, and uh, at the time it was just a small thing. They weren't moving a whole lot, but he was on, he was on eBay, and it said pro- pro- professionals only, right? But here I am, still out of my house, and um, but I, I knew, like I've been reading, I've been, I was scouring all the forums. I even got Guy Atchison's reinventing the tattoo book. I read that. I was on his forum. Another thing, pros only, but I was like, I think we're all scratchers on that, you know? Like we're all just trying to learn. Uh, uh, but anyways, um, I. Uh, I wanted to try out this rotary and so I got this Neotat and um, the guy was, he was really super cool and he was so knowledgeable. Like I learned so much about like motors and like certain materials and plastics and stuff like that from talking to him on the phone Whoa. and he was super, super nice. He just retained it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's not a tattooer, he's, he's an engineer, you know, yeah. and um, he pretty much was like, as far as I'm concerned, he was the one that started that whole slider concept. But um, I got it and the stroke was like 1.8 millimeters or like maybe a two, Whoa. two millimeters. It was ridiculously short. So like it would, um, unless you're using a three liner or something, you'd, you'd snag in the skin and everything, but it was pretty cool. But I thought like, there's no give in this and the coils have give. And I was on the forums like rotary suck. There's no adjustable stroke. You can't adjust the stroke. You can't adjust the give. You can't adjust anything. It just moves up and down and that's it. So, I went and I called Ray and I was like, Hey, I'm a machinist and I really want to, I want to kind of make my own machine. And I kind of just want a little bit different than yours, but could I buy a motor and, um, could I buy a motor from you and maybe like a motor and a cam? And so he sent this, um, he said, he sold me a wired up motor. I couldn't solder at the time. I didn't know how to solder. It was stupid. I could weld, but I yeah. didn't know how to solder. Like, could you just like wire it up too? Like, I mean, so he sent it with the, the Neotat end cap on it. Mm. So I made this Neotat slider thing, but I did it to where there was the slide just lifted up a spring. Um, I had like basically a nipple on a, on a flat spring and the slide would lift up the lift it up. And then it would, it would drop this slide down and actually it was an amazing color packer. And I still, Whoa. I'll show you here in a little bit, but, um, I modeled it completely after a Neotat. So it looks like a Neotat, even though I made, I made it yeah. manually. And then I even had it. So I drilled and tapped the holes so that his cover plate would go onto it. Um, uh, but it had give, it was a rotary that had give and people were like, Oh, you can't make a rotary that has give. And I'm like, no, I just made one. And, yeah. um, it worked pretty good, but then I didn't want to get clowned by people. So I, I just kind of put it aside instead of working with that idea, I just kind of stuck it in a drawer and didn't even use it. Mm. And, um, I kept on fucking with coils and I wasn't really getting anywhere. And, um, I was, I was making coils left and right. And like, I couldn't do anything better than what was already out there. Like, but even though I want to buy a coil, I get it in the, 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 um, the armature bar would be hitting crooked. And then the, the spring would be like fucked up. And so I, every time I'd spend money on a coil, I was automatically respringing it, retuning it, filing the, filing the, um, uh, the Contest. front coil down, okay. shimming stuff up. Mm-hmm. It's just like, I was getting stuff. Oh, this guy's machine is awesome. And I get it like, no, it's like, it's not awesome. And like, yeah. I'm, but I don't even know what's, what I'm doing. I don't know what's, uh, it wasn't making sense at that time. Uh, now I can make a pretty good coil. Yeah. But, uh, um, so anyways, yeah, it was about four years of, um, of tattooing before I finally decided, um, I was going to start, building machines um so to back up i had when i got out of the military i was mm-hmm. i had my own shop i started my own shop i was like fuck this i don't want to work for anybody i've already been taking shit for too long in the military and mm. um but i self-destructed and um the shop was a failure and i lost a lot of friends uh just because like i was stressed out and like just you know substance abuse even if you know people like laugh if you say like weed is substance abuse but i mean to me, it's just hits me too hard. So like, I was totally just like just blurring out like my whole day. I was just yeah. intoxicated on, on, you know, like my, out of my fucking head. And yeah, um, anything can be abused and every drug can't have a yeah. personal use. And like, like some, like some of my best friends are alcoholics in the sense that they don't drink because they're an alcoholic and they know that that's the wrong thing. So for me, I decided like, I can't smoke because I start doing it all the time. 
I'd do it in the morning and afternoon and then I could like, always want it, you know? So, um, I had to walk away from, from that. And then I went, I closed my shop. I fired my apprentice who like, we were best friends. And then I just pretty much told him like, you have to go back to Idaho. And, um, he doesn't really talk to me anymore. None of the people that, that from that time frame talk to me anymore. Right. Um, so I kind of like started over at, um, at a friend of mine's shop. Um, and I was there for like four years and, um, I started like, okay, I'm ready to do something. Tattooing wasn't enough for me. I always have to do like a couple things and I couldn't just be a tattooer. And I, um, I ended up getting this book called the artist's way. And I was trying to figure out where my artistic path was or and what I thought was I was going to read this book and discover my creative tattoo style or something. I didn't know what to expect, but I thought it was going to help me with tattooing in this book. It's this, the spiritual path to creativity is with a the, the book that's like the, the artist way and then down below the spiritual path to creativity and it, it clarified this is not a churchy a churchy book this is this isn't about like jesus and or allah or anything this is right. about like the great the benevolent energy in the universe that's like the creative force that drives everything you know there's a positive mm. creative force in the universe like the, the universe is very creative right now um, right. So anyways, um, and it kind of explained that we're all like, what makes us human is our creativity. And like, we're very creative things. Like, I don't know very any other creatures, any animals that are creative like us, you know, like individually, like beavers make dams, but all beavers make dams. It's not like they learned and then they developed more dams and then like mm. got to outer space or something, right. you know, but, um, but in it, like I, I, part of the book was you write these like four pages of longhand, um, notes you just wake up first thing in the morning you wake up and you write four pages Triple. out on on an, in a journal and it's mm -hmm. your morning pages and i did it i was like really want to take this serious i want to figure out who i am artistically you, who put you on this book where'd you find this i was just at the bookstore and i just saw i saw this book the artist i'm like oh that's kind of cool i'm gonna i want to check it out okay you know um but i got it and so i religiously was like waking up and drawing um or writing notes in the whole journal about every just stream of conscious. So they, they say, don't think about it. And if you get to the point where you don't know what to write, just write, I don't know what to write over and over again. And then within like writing that about five times, you'll actually figure out something else to write. Cause you're going to oh, get wow. sick of, of writing. I don't know what to write. And I was doing this and it said, don't read your morning pages, just do them every morning. And then two months into the book, cause like you just you read one chapter a week. And then that whole week you just do these morning pages and like process, it gives you an yeah. assignment of something to kind of meditate on for the week. And a lot of, some of the stuff was like, what would you do? Name five other professions that you would like to do or the things. And then you're writing all this stuff out. Um, but I started realizing that what I started writing about in my journal was tattoo machines. And I didn't even know, like I was into it kind of, and I was, but I wasn't really taking it that serious. And I actually did buy like a little, um, little lathe mill combo thing. And I was kind of dinking around, but I'm not, not serious, not at the level that I am now. Um, but I got that. And finally in the book, it said, now go back and read your morning pages mm. and address these things, your recurring things. And you're going to like find your direction now because for three months you've been writing every morning, your stream of conscious, your very freshest thoughts in your head that haven't been influenced by the day or your stress of the day or anything. And, um, were the thoughts consistent? It started to become more and more consistent. And then what I also started doing also was realizing that I would write about, Oh, I got this person. She's coming in. She wants these like, watercolory butterflies and I kind of complain about it and then I start thinking like but maybe I can do something other than the drawing that she brought in you know right. maybe like how would I do this and I start realizing that most of the time when I draw something people will just get it like they're like wow he actually drew this and it's pretty cool and it's it's original so I just started doing it like I'm just gonna draw it and like you know the bottom line is is 90% of the time they're gonna go with my drawing and if not like the odds are in my favor that I'm going to get to do a cool tattoo instead of something that's going to hate me, make mm. me hate tattooing, you know? Um, so I started taking people's ideas that were kind of lame and it's really kind of thinking like, how can I take this? That seems just super boring and dumb and reinvent it. And it's like, take it. So like 
totally like erase my idea of Pinterest or my idea of like everybody else does this black and gray realistic scorpion this certain way. Right. And I started just approaching it. Like with scorpions, that was the flash. We had all the only scorpions I'd done prior to that were like the one, you know, the, 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 the like the biker style one with the drop mm. shadow underneath yeah, the it, the, the yeah. three quarter view. And, yeah. and I keep doing that over and over again. Like that's the way we do a scorpion. And I started thinking about it. Like scorpions are cool. Like there's a, a stinger and there's like these gnarly looking legs and pinchers and like weird like lines in the body. It's, it's like, alien. and then like little like prongs coming off the claws. And like, just like looking at a real scorpion and being like, there's some cool elements here, like super cool elements. And it doesn't have to be the dorky, like over and over done scorpion. Yeah. Um, so in a way, like I, I learned that I'm really into tattoo machines and that as a, I started out my life wanting to be a machinist and now I knew how to tattoo. I knew like when my machine was faulting out or when it was a technique problem, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm ready to start making machines. I came back around. Yeah. And I came, came back around, but now I was competent at tattooing that I could take a, I don't have to tattoo as much anymore to stay on it. But right. I think four years of muscle memory, like I think you really need a good four or five years of like all the time doing tattoos to really cement, right. cement that muscle memory. And, and you also saying earlier, kind of like how, you know, people got to get stuck in their ways in the first couple of years. Like you learn the majority of what you do in tattooing in your first few years of tattooing. Yeah. Like I draw rows this way. Nope, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but even then just habits and the way you stretch your skin, like does that really like change over the years? Like the way you hunch the way, like unless you, unless someone tells you, why do you do that way? You'll just probably do it that way forever. Yeah. You know? Um, I think you go, I always try to question what I'm doing and try to approach it. And I, you know, the funny thing is, is once I started, once my machine started taking off, um, my tattoos got better because I'm, so much more in tune with like, how would I, how would I tattoo with this new machine? And like, I'm always like, I was definitely not set in my ways. Every time mm. I tattoo, I'm using a new prototype. Like I never use the same machine more than five times before I'm on to the next thing. Or I go back to the house and I change the stroke or file this or make more spring tension. And, and, um, so all the time I'm trying to reinvent how I do a tattoo. And then I started getting to where people were asking me for 14 liners. Like I want to, I want a machine that does 14 liners. So mm -hmm. when, by the time I'm trying to accomplish something like stippling or, a, or single needle or 14 lines or 25 mags, all of a sudden I have to go buy some 25 mags and some 14 liners and some, some bug pin Let's threes. See if do it. And all of a sudden I got to start learning whippy, whippy dot stippling. You know, I gotta, I have to do all those tasks and it becomes more fun. Like, how do I accomplish, like I do a tattoo and some of my style has been, when I do this tattoo to test this machine, I need a, I need an 11 liner. Yeah. I need a, a seven mag. I need a 15 mag. I need a bug pin three. And like, I want a machine, like my parameter is, I really want this machine to drive at least an 11 liner, a bug pin three. I want to do stippling. I want to do whip shading. I want to do black and gray kind of, I don't, I'm not too concerned with that. My, my client base doesn't care mm -hmm. too much about that for the most part. Um, but there's all these techniques that I'm trying to do. And then I start having to, to incorporate that into my tattooing. You got to see if the tattoo can hit the, the machine can hit those yeah. marks. And yeah. it's fun. And I go through phases, but like, I think right now I'm kind of getting back to where I just want to use like one liner and one, one shader. It's, yeah. there's some, it's very liberating to just use like a, a seven or eight liner. And yeah. this kind of like right in the middle where you can get a thick line or mm. a thin. And yeah, um, I feel like it's like, I was doing something where I went through this phase a few years ago or I think a lot of people were, where I was, I was like, everyone's at the race for the boldest tattoo, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, what makes this cool? It's bright and it's bold. Well, mine's gonna be brighter, mine's gonna be way bolder, you yeah. know? And, and I was using like 18 rounds and lighting them on fire, and I was yeah. like, fucking stupid, you know what I mean? It looked really cool that day. It looked like an old-ass tattoo that day, but when it's an old-ass tattoo, it's yeah. fucking, you can't tell what it is, no way. And then I, I kind of like, I was I was using, like, okay, I'll use these big needles for these big tattoos and the smaller is this size. But then it was like, I do a sleeve and like it was out of scale. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it was like, Oh, that one's too bold. This one's too thin. And then, so I started, went back to nines and then my friend Christian, he was like, he was like, there's something about eight. It's like, you don't have that extra one. Like you don't need nine. Like, yeah. And I was like, I was like, Oh, and it, and it was like, it just seemed like, Oh, I can do a small tattoo. I can do a big tattoo. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and if it looks like it's incomplete, I'll do more to the big tattoo. And I think so for me, like kind of having like, you know, just these, these like, 
um, limitations, it kind of creates a style. Like for sure, this is all I have, so this is all I can do. Like I, I let my if my client um, or my guest, right? Yeah. <laughs> if my guest, <laughs> I love it. My my that. guest of honor. Um, yeah. If if I they are picky, uh, most of the time they're not because I've tattooed them so much. It's we don't we can just we don't even have to talk a whole lot about what we're mm. tattooing. I just. Yeah, like maybe look at this bird on my wrist. I'm like, I, I got it. You don't even you don't even have to say. Like, I I know I know your tattoos better than you do now. Like, yeah, I'm just yeah. Gonna, I know it needs I, to go underneath that yeah. one. So do the one above it. Yeah. With respect, I'm not I'm not an asshole like that. But um, um, but anyways, if if there is sometimes like when they're newer and I don't like they don't have enough tattoos that I can look at and start matching mm. up stuff, I'll like you get to pick three colors. Right. And like and then I'll pull out like which blues and I, I kind of lay out a palette of mm. of like these bottles of ink and then they can pick That's like cool. i like this one and i'll put those three colors together and they can kind of look and like that, that palette looks good you know like let's let's go with this palette and um, i learned that from troy uh yeah. destroy troy because uh, cool. he did that on, on a tattoo for me like he, he's like how about this palette here and i was like i'm, I'm using that yeah. that's cool it's like they get and they have more of a hand in it it's yeah like, you know? but like you're picking out a color palette rather than being like, I want the leaves green and I want this flower yellow and I want this thing. This uh, like, you can kind of look at several colors and you go into the tattoo and like, this is what I got to work with. And I think it's, I always try to do that. Um, whether it's with designing a machine or especially with machines, but, um, with tattoos, like I want to, I want a, a limitation. Like if I use three needles, I can only use one color. You know, like I, if I, if, if I have these many options here, like I wouldn't want to use a bug pin three, uh, an 11 liner and a big mag and red, blue and, and whatever, you know, brown. I wouldn't want to put three colors on top of three different things, lines. It's too, well. too much. But if it's colorful, I want a very simple line weight. Mm. And if it's, if it's just mono, monotone, I want maybe more. I More agree lines. with that. Yeah. When, I, when I'm doing like, you know, the black and gray stuff too, like it's like, I'm like, ooh, I can like, okay, maybe I'm just using black, but I can have this whippy area and then I can have this like saturated area and I can have this open area and I can maybe yeah. this is a gray area. And it's like, it's like, oh, I got a lot done with a little and that feels like accomplishing. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's cool. It's fun. It's a fun trick to like put limitations and then I feel like I become more creative and the yes. tattoos come out better because I, agree. I didn't have the world at my fingertips of like all these colors and all these needles and like 25 different groupings with my, and I feel like if you do that, you don't know when the tattoo's done. Like, cause you, yeah. you have like, Oh, well I need to use this purple cause it's laid out, you know? And I yeah. think that I think by setting those limitations, like you, you go through this process of, of, of elimination. You're like, Oh, well it's done. There's nothing left to do to it. And that feels good. Cause I see a lot of tattoos that were done like 20 minutes ago. You know what I mean? It's like, I just don't want to do that. I'm already an overthinker. Yeah. So if I, if I like, like simplify my setup, like, and I overthink it. At least, at least I still have these. That's like, all you got to think about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So like with machines, um, it actually makes it harder on me. Like mm. I set limitations, like my machine can now be any longer than 2.3 inches and no taller than two inches. Right. And it can't be like, I want this, 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 and this. I want it to do, I'll say when I set out to design a machine, I want an adjustable stroke or I want, I need some sort of, and everything, I want some sort of way that you can make the machine work for you. And if yeah. you learn it, like there's, like when, you know, I want it to where you can flip the clip cord one way and it, it cycles the, the action. Yeah. yeah, like, and so you can figure it out. And um, so sometimes if people use my machine for 10 minutes, like, yeah, it wasn't for me. Like, it's going to take you like a, like weeks to like, figure out all of its magic like there's yeah. a lot of steps like when you didn't like it this way you know you could have flipped the clip cord or you, you can just turn disengage the voltage spring up just or, like yeah. boom and it's a whole different world, yeah like you know? i mean there's you have so many so many variables there mm. and um uh but yeah i always like an element of you can do some do some different things and i then at the size parameters i feel like i keep wanting things to be smaller and smaller and smaller mm. and um and more condensed and i i think that that's the the artistic side of me, like and when I do tattoos, I actually like to do the, fill the space, the, make the, the most effective use out of space on somebody's arm to okay. like, where it doesn't look, I don't want it to be congested, but I want to be very brilliant with how I would piece something in and like work with the other tattoos and like make that tattoo play off the shapes and right. of the other ones and um, how I can actually cram a pretty big tattoo 
into a tight spot and then like how does it even fit there like i can have this like pit thing like this and like get it like right here and then it doesn't that right puzzle yeah. piece. but i think more i actually i've been trying to do more breathing room in between like i don't want mm. like i want to do a tattoo on an arm i kind of want to see the whole thing from from one angle like i want to be able to i don't want it to be too clunky anymore you know what i noticed that i i feel like um it's different looking at an arm opposed to looking at your own arm but i feel like when you're getting tattooed like with like you know the armband is stacking and you're looking at it like this and you're never taking a step back to look at it you know and i think that you know when you see one tattoo on an arm it's like fuck yeah more must be better and then when you start laying them out it's like yeah 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 but when you look at it from a distance like i feel like collectively they're kind of lost you know yeah. what i mean so i i feel the same way that i kind of i always when I do a tattoo on someone, I always like enjoy it more when it's just kind of sitting on that arm. Mm -hmm. And when I do start to build out the arm, it's really cool, but it's kind of like, I don't know. I, I kind of like it like less is more. I don't yeah. Know. Come on, well, see the tattoo I, on the skin. What I'm starting to do now is I'll trace out the spot mm. and then I make an outline and then I, then I close everything in another half. I did, I make an outline around that outline to like make sure I, I'm, yeah, so you give yourself that. Like, Try and like, because like before, I've I've always been like every square inch, and most of my clients, they, most people getting tattoos they want now, that. they want like complete saturation. Yep. They don't want any skin showing anymore, mm -hmm. and I I've, I've been kind of making every spot fill up, so that when they say yeah, I want to, when we're gonna do the background, I'm like oh we'll get to it, we'll just get everything else in there, and then like we get down to like. So I guess we're not doing any background because there's no room, right? Like, exactly. Yeah. That's what I dig too. It's like, oh, just like, there's a gap around this dragon. I'm throwing one cloud there. And now it's a solid oval. You know what I mean? Like on yeah. to the next one, you know? Like it all just comes together. I, yeah, I don't, it's a tricky one for me. I, I feel that. Yeah. So then back to the machines. So like, so you go from like the coils and then you make like this like adjustable stroke rotary. And where does that go from there? So the rotary thing was just died off quick. And I was like, Cause I didn't know where to start. Like I didn't know where to get motors from. I didn't know like can't, bearings, like little bearings. So I go and search for bearings and like mm. it would pull up. It wouldn't pull up the ball bearings that I was looking for or something. I like looking at, I get so confused by all of it. I didn't know what, like, what to look for in voltages or how to look at motors and see like what motor would be the right one. It was just too much for me to digest. Like where to find bearings, where to find motors, where to get this, how to make a cam, you know? And I, all I got's a, a, a little, you know, little mill um, in the back corner, but I, you know, how to do all this stuff. Um, I figured it all out, you know, how to make a lot of my stuff manually when I first started. But, um, but anyways, um, I was with the coils and then I got to the point, what happened was, is I was, I was building, I was buying machines about once a month trying to find the unicorn. Mm. And my wife at the time, like I was tattooing, I was, you know, we weren't, she was still going through school and she was working part time and then I was tattooing, but they didn't have a full time spot for me. And so we're like, we're just living, you know, we yeah. weren't like, we weren't, we weren't making a living, but we were paying our bills and that was it. And, um, I'm like, I'm ready to get a, a machine. I'm ready to spend 500 now because everything that I've gotten for like 300 mm. is kind of like, I've, I still have to fuck with it. And I'm still like back to square one. It's not any better than the other machine I got. Right. And I still had to mess with it. By that time it's like, it was me. So I didn't get anything better than what I could already make. Um, and um, I was like, I want to get this Ken Cameron machine. I hear these like, they're awesome. And she, my wife's like, well, how much is it? And I'm like, it's 500. She's like, fuck. I mean, she wasn't going to say no. She's like, I know this is for your job and you, you need it, but you just bought a machine last month. And like yeah. and the month before that, like it was 300 and then it was 350. And then I'm buying like 400 and 450 machines. Where's it in? Yeah. And she's like, we, like, can you just do with what you got? I'm like, I have to have a good liner. I have to be able to get through my tattoo. And like my, my liner is that thing, like a coil, like it would just poop out like halfway through the tattoo is like oh it sucks now and like i couldn't go faster like i couldn't use it for threes i could only use my coil it's, it was only good for a seven liner mm -hmm. it's like pretty much everything was just that one needle um so anyways i could tell she wasn't gonna say no but at the same time i didn't want to like stress her out and i knew she was really starting to bug her that i had this machine addiction right and uh, i i thought about it and i was on craigslist and I saw that there's a Smithy, which is a lathe mill combo uh, machine. There's actually one in the background. You can kind of see okay. it back there uh, with all the dust on it because I don't use it. <laughs> um, but I'm like, on Craigslist, I found this thing and it's 1200 bucks or 1300 mm. And I'm like, if I get this, 
I have my lathe, I have my mill, I have a TIG welder already because I bought that for, uh, for making bicycles. Right. And so that was collecting dust. If I do that and then I get like $400 of tooling. So I just want to, I want to have a $2,000 investment into this stuff and I will not buy any more tattoo machines except there's money that I made off making stuff with this equipment. This is oh. going to be my hobby. I'm going to just pick up metalworking. And this is before I discovered the whole thing that I actually want to do machine building. I was just like, I like I'm just going to tinker around, you know. Yeah. I'm going to make a couple of machines for myself and just set out on that endeavor. And I was making these coils, and they're actually kind of neat. I was making these. I wanted to make, like, a configurable coil, like, where you could bolt, bolt everything on and then change stuff. You could put different coil cores on, and, like, the Whoa. spring shelf would bolt on. So you could put a, a one-inch coil or an inch and a quarter coils on. You could do all this stuff. You could angle back the, the upright, you know, make it, you know, wherever. Yeah. Um, and there's kind of a neat little project, but still the coils, they weren't there. Like I, I just, I didn't know enough about how to spring them up and get them to hit the way I wanted. And I was just guessing. Um, and I was showing these guys, this, this is a shop that um, I really respected their work. They're like the premier private studio in Kansas City. And um, I went in and I was showing them my stuff. I was getting some tattoos from them. And, um, and I showed them my coils. Like, yeah, you know what, man, we're on to rotaries now. Running into coils, Whoa. but if and I don't, I'm not interested in your coils. But if you want to make us some rotaries, we'll buy them. And I'm like, really? And like, yeah. Well, we're using these direct drives, these Mike Metaxa direct drives. And what we don't like is that they're bolt-on things. And then like when it comes loose, and I try to bolt it back on, it's all crooked. And it's just, mm. I want something like, I want it like a a solid thing. Like I want to put a motor into a tube and then have that come. You know, I just mm. they so they kind of told me what they wanted. And I'm like, gave you some direction. Yeah, I'm like, like that. and he goes. Yeah, I can make some of that. Uh, how, mu- and goes, how much do you want for it? I'm like, oh, it's just a rotary, uh, 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we, it's like, I don't know where to get the motors. Like, we got the motors. We know where to get the motors and the flywheels. So I have a motors and flywheels that we've, we've got. So if you just make the frame, then uh, we got the other stuff. And I was like, yeah, I can make a frame for 50 bucks. And so then I go and get the material and realize that the material was um, too big for my lathe, that I had oh. like this tube. And so I was having to do all this shit like, I spent, I spent three weeks trying to make six. They, they like, oh, for fifty bucks, I'll take three of them. And the guy, the guy's like, yeah, I'll take three. So I spent like three weeks fucking with this stuff on this equipment that I had that was not meant to to do this. Yeah. And it was it was so hard, but I got done. I was like, holy shit, these look cool. Like this does not look like. I thought rotaries are just stupid. Like I didn't yeah. like the way they looked. Um, I didn't like that they're like quiet. And I didn't, you know, this is this soulless. But when I made these and I welded them up and torched the steel and everything is like, I actually like this a lot. Mm. You know, this looks cool. And then when I ran them, I was like, holy shit, it runs exactly. And then I run, make another one. It runs exactly the same way too. And I started thinking, my God, there is a whole world of rotaries that's been untapped. Like nobody's doing anything. With coils, I felt like it's already been done. And I can only, I can only make a coil as good as, the next guy, if if that even. And why with, take when you have something else? On? But with the rotaries, I was like, man, there's a whole like untapped world, and like I can, there's so much I can do. Like I know the motor's going to spin this fast, and I can change the volts and change the speed, and then I can start changing the stroke, and I can do this, and um, it all just started to click. And then once I read that book, and I was like, I actually want to be a machine builder, and like I I think I really need to take this serious and pay. I need to follow that inner voice, that inner creative voice that's like wants to do this because I would originally you know it's with the bicycles and i was gonna make all these innovative bike parts until like i couldn't ride anymore and so i lost my heart wasn't in it if i can't do the the hobby for the products i make then how I, are you connected to I, it? I, yeah I'm, I'm disconnected at that point it's just another business i'm just making right. something for somebody and i don't care like it's just money at that point and uh, my tattoo machines are way more than money like you're getting you're buying my machine you're buying like a part of my soul you yeah. know like it's it's me i uh I, I support my machine habit, but I have to sell them to people. But I'm making machines for myself. I'm on my little, trying to solve this little riddle, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I got into the, the rotaries, and I set out um, that when I finally discovered, like, I actually do want to make rotaries, and this is actually really cool. Um, my friend is at New Year's. is t- 2011, the, the new year, and my friend that I worked with, Raymond, he said, this this year, my New Year's resolution, I am gonna paint, make a painting once a month. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I think I'm gonna do a machine once a month. I th- I'll make a machine once a month. But Raymond's kind of a slacker, and I was like, you know what? Fuck Raymond. I'm gonna make a machine once a week. 
you know, I'm going to be in it. Like, I'm not going to just like half-ass this. I'm going to do every, on my days off, I'm going to go into my garage and I'm going to be on my smithy and I'm going to make something every week. I'm going to like work those two days. That's my hobby. That's what I do for fun is, is work in my machine shop. Right. And, um, uh, I went to town on that and I think by May I actually had a pretty, I had my first mini cranker. I made like old shit i got this and i was making the direct drives but it's just boring it's just a direct drive and all i was doing is you know it was nothing new like the, the frame looked cool and that was new and different but right. people weren't that interested in and at the time but they're still just spinning like yeah yeah there's nothing nothing more to it i wasn't the i felt the look and the the look and the aesthetic of the machine was was definitely something worth like hey that's actually really cool and i, I don't like rotaries but that that looks cool um but yeah, then I started thinking of the mini cranker. I wanted to do something with the crank deal. And my friend Ugly Bill of Special Technique, um, he had this backwards, the seesaw um, slingshot um, rotary that he did. And I actually tried one and I was like, damn, this thing's really good. For the time, I was like, shit, I really like this. And I went to Workhorse Iron's website because they're selling through Workhorse. And uh, um, I'm just going to buy one. I'm not going to make one. I'll just, I'll just buy one in so mm-hmm. I can have it. And um, they were out of stock, and Bill didn't have any parts. It's like, you know what? I'm just gonna make one. And so I went and made this like reverse rotary, and I posted. I was a little proud of myself, so I posted it on Facebook. Look what I made! Like Workhorse Irons is out of stock, so I just made my own. Mm-hmm. And um, Soba got on there and was like, I can't believe you do that. And like Bills are freaking out. He's like, Oh my God, you can't do this! You can't do this! I need this is my thing. Just you can't. I'm not saying never do it, but like I just need to like have my parade right now. Just don't make this machine yeah. please and he's like and i was a little pissed off i was like man like like you you start off making a crank style rotary like like based off the swiss rotary and you know then you kind of did this like i'm just trying to like start somewhere and like i just want to make it i'm not going to like produce them mm-hmm. um but then he kind of like he laid it out was like please as a friend please don't make this please take that picture down don't do it you felt that come back around to you, though. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> you know what? I was bummed out. I was really like, fuck, this is really cool, and I was like really excited about it, and I and I did do it differently than him, but it, the essence was there. I was I was basically biting his dick, and yeah. um, I, and I realized later, like, yeah, that was kind of messed up. I don't want to do that. Um, but I was sitting there talking to my wife like about it, and like, man, I I want to. I want that platform. I liked how I could get this this give and the hit the way he had it and everything. Is like, well, can't you just do that frontwards? Like, and I started thinking like, oh shit, I can. I made a hollow armature bar on my mini cranker and then I put a rod through there. It was a nipple and so it kind of right. was actually floating and it was cool because it actually didn't look weird. Like it wasn't like the seesaw thing and the armature bar is longer, you know, and everything. Like this was actually, this is actually cool and then people just like latched onto that they're like that's i'm into it and um i started making them and um yeah i went down my garage and i I just made a mini cranker that day i just had the idea and i made it and i made about 15 different bars trying to get the depth right like where to do Mm. it and it was actually hit pretty good i mean you could for a while that was my liner that i was saying to you but it was no sidewinder but i mean you i was putting 14 lines in with with it um so I, um, I made, uh, I started making those and then they started just building. I found this rotary forum, like, be- like it wasn't social media. It was just like it's owned the rotary yeah. tattoo forum and they, um, they started like, it started getting more and more popular. And then all of a sudden these people were hitting me up like, Hey, I like that machine. Um, can I get one? And they're like all in like Sweden, like everybody in Europe, I'm still way more popular in Europe than I am in the U S mm. but they're just in, into that. Like they, they, what do you think the reasoning is for rotaries being out there like so much? Is there just not a lot of like coil builders or like I see a in lot Europe? of Europe? Yeah, when I go overseas, they're using stuff from here. You know, um, the biggest thing is, um, I don't know why it's stuff from the U.S., but the biggest thing is, is for the longest time, rotaries were that's what they used in in Europe. I, I guess was well, maybe it's because illegal, kind of like that in New York. They used rotaries because they're quiet and they're up in a room. Okay. I think there's a lot of that. They have a a, lo- a much longer history of rotaries than coils. And like we're over here, it's like Thomas Edison. You know the coil. You know all this stuff. So like mm-hmm. I think that was bigger. And so there's definitely that. And I think that um I think it's like a European 
thing you know like i think europeans appreciate the the mentality there's like a european car this it's more elegant than a, like a chevy you okay. know they just do little things like for me i think my machines are because they're innovative um i think a lot of europeans really value innovation and like especially functional and i think they're more educated uh buyer like they would look at something they don't i don't I think they would look at a product and not look at an advertisement with like flashy loud stuff okay. and bright shiny things. Like I think that they're more like they did the research and I think this is good and then it's beautiful. Um, just like you look at um, look at a Volkswagen compared to a Chevy. You know, like right. there's just better lines in it. It's just a it's it's just more elegant. Um, European made tools like there's usually like a they don't have to have this fancy curve and this little indent, but they do it because it just just looks good you know it just why not why not just make this thing look beautiful you don't have to just hack off a piece of steel and like mm. grind it down like it can actually look pretty and and take a few more minutes on that part and just make it elegant right and and i think by looking at elegant beautiful things like it ups your own standard for stuff like you want more things to be elegant and you start respecting beauty and things and and oh, things yeah. should flow like nature's beautiful like you you know it's like it's flows and it, it looks good you know it's the same thing like when we like a blocky blocky old stuff i mean i know it has a style and some people are into that but um i think that i just latch on to that more elegant art mm. artistic approach to engineering right so well i think it just comes from from making it you know what i mean like you want to take pride in it you know like they start out rough because they're rough and when they're perfected you want to show it off yeah yeah and uh, I think there's beauty in the roughness too, uh, and in, in its own thing. I love the rough, rough cut stuff. But the more better I get, it's like I just kind of don't want to go backwards on things. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think every once in a while it's fun, like go weld up a mini cranker again and do some stuff. But I got too many fancy tricks. You know, I want to. I just want to keep moving forward. You yeah. know. And, so in like short like window like of like what eight years when like that stuff started like happening, happening, going in and in and on machines like there's so much innovations happen that short time period. It's not like you were like, here's the machine I make, you know, like that cabinet out there is insane. And these are all like different. And I buy one and the next month there's a new one. It's like, and this one's not out and there's one ahead of it. Like, you know, it doesn't stop. So, so I mean, what I guess, yeah. So how did that, every machine where you're making, like was, was it always like that? The next one was something else. Like you're reinventing well, the machine every time. Some of the times, like I make something and then somebody complains about it mm -hmm. and, or I see something and it breaks and I'm like, it doesn't break all the time. But like when I'm the only guy that does the repairs, you see, it all. if, if 1% of the machines are breaking, that's a big problem. You right. know, that's a lot of shit. And like if half of them are overseas. It's like, man, you're tying up $150 in shipping just to get it back and forth, you know? And like, it's just, it's ridiculous. So I'm always on the quest to like make something that like performs um, and also to hopefully not break. And that's right. a very challenging thing. You can't drive a car for more than a year without having to get it serviced. Like, and these are cars, you know, like they've been making cars for a long time. Like I'm using a tattoo machine that cycles aggressively at like 6,000 cycles a second and, um, or 6,000 RPMs or hundred cycles a second. Um, shit's going to break eventually. And especially when you mistreat it or run it too hard or like throw corrosive sterilants all over it. Um, but anyways, I'm always on that thing like, man, this broke. How do I fix it? Or sometimes like somebody's like, hey, this doesn't, this doesn't do it for me. Like it doesn't pack the way I want it to. And I start thinking like, well, maybe, maybe this, or maybe I can make something for that person's hand, you know, or mm. like how like there's enough people who would complain about this. But more than that, I think I get bored with it. I make something and it's awesome and I'm over it. Like I just... I treat my tattoo machines like I couldn't like I, like I'd be a womanizer to women like but instead it's like I'm a I'm a machinizer like I use yeah. it like oh you're awesome I'll do anything to be with you and then I got you yeah it's over like <laughs> already over it I I slayed you already <laughs> moving on like right. I'm, I'm sick of your fucking ass you know yeah. <laughs> but um so yeah my me I think half of it is. I start seeing stuff break or I start finding shortcomings. Like once I, once the honeymoon's over, I start seeing like, I don't like that. And I don't like that. And mm -hmm. this could be better or this could go together better. And if the, if I could get it to be put together better, eventually the idea is that I can make stuff that other people, I could trust that somebody who has no mechanical inclination can fix their own machine. Mm 
Mm. But right now it's like kind of hard. Like I don't want to send all these parts out and people just make their machine worse, you know? So, so I don't know. Like I think honestly, I just keep getting ideas in my head and I can't put them down. And it's just another idea and another idea. And it's like, I just, I'm just going with what the voice in my head's telling me to do. Yeah. Right? So the goal is like is to eventually have them a bit more streamlined where people can service them. Yeah. yeah. Eventually it's gonna get to where like I'm I just wanna make stuff and I don't I don't wanna have to fix everything. Prepare forever. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but like I also don't wanna say like, fuck you to the customer and say like, no, this is disposable. You you use this for two years, buy mm. a new one. I don't I don't believe in a disposable thing. Even though I'm in a in the business of making a product, I I think that the products should be repairable and like should um, you should be able to have something and have that machine for 10 years. It's not, I can't fix it for free indefinitely, yeah. but um, uh, I mean, you made a lot of money with it and, and if it moves, it wears and if it wears, it breaks, you know, like it's going to break. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. I just keep wanting a different hit. I want something like every machine I make, I'm actually trying to make a liner. And like I get done with it, like actually it's just a really good shader. Right. <laughs> and like I can't, I keep trying to replace my sidewinder, and I can't. Like it's if I'm gonna make a better, if I'm gonna make something to replace the sidewinder, it's gonna be a sidewinder seven. Yeah. <laughs> the eight or nine. Like, yeah, it just keeps going and going. But uh, other times it's just I get I get sick of making the same thing, and I just want to move on. And my way of moving forward is um, instead of switching career paths all the time, I just make a different kind of machine you know and it yeah. keeps it fresh like in my family like we always want something new and different and my dad like had so many different jobs growing up he was like a mechanic and then he was a computer programmer and he was a car salesman and an inventory guy and he bought homes and fixed them and sold them and he he's a custom harvest farmer and he's a wow. pilot and a, a marine and inf- infantry marine in vietnam and like he's done so many things in his life and every time he just gets to a point like he's really smart and he gets to the point like, I'm I done. I, I've learned everything. I've climbed that mountain and I'm done. And moves on to something else and has to start all the way over. And for me, I'm like, I want more mastery. You know, I want, I've latched onto this and I haven't mastered it. Like I, when every time I think I got to the top of the mountain, I realized that there was just a cloud and I got to a plateau and then like, oh yeah, that mountain goes up and it just keeps going and going. You yeah. know, like I, I don't know where the end of it is, but it, it just keeps eluding me and I keep wanting to, keep Mm. keep wanting to see where i can go with it with these like ideas that seem like almost infinite and hanging out with you this weekend and show me the secret sketchbook and (laughs) and all these things are so far ahead like how do you how do you crack down and and take one at a time like i don't know just like get overwhelmed with all of that i I do and like like i go on my walks in the morning it's like my time like my brain's just going and um and i think and i just kind of like whatever whatever the most realistic thing to try is and like I start thinking I have like 10 ideas Mm -hmm. but one is so far out where another one's a spinoff of something I've already done that I already know three-fourths of it is gonna work right you know I want to start there and then I'll try something and sometimes I'll try something and it leads to this and like my original idea didn't work it's a good platform revisiting something because but um I'm I I have these other things and sometimes what I'll do is I'll entertain an idea that's really outlandish I'll kind of do it on my day off. Like I'll just be in here like when I don't feel like working, but I feel like playing, you mm-hmm. know, and I'll like try something. But then um, it is definitely a challenge because right now I have like, I have this idea. I have like three ideas for different coil machines right now. Mm-hmm. I have an idea for another direct drive. I have ideas for this other kind of like armature bar thing. Um, any direction I want to point in, I got another idea for it. I want to try it. I got my slider and I'm already on to thinking of my next slider, which will actually be an armature bar version of that slider. Mm-hmm. Um, I think some people are really going to like that slider, but um, I kind of want to try the next thing. And right. um, I'm just kind of waiting. I want to be like fully, fully pleased and f- feel like I fully tapped the current potential that I that I can do with my slider before I move to the next, next project. Yeah. But in between that, I've also uh, made this V3R, like the, the remastered Sidewinder, which oh. I thought was going to take like a week. I was like, oh yeah, I'm just going to get this real quick and then do it. And like, I was on it for two months and like, mm. just keep trying to like, what about this? What about that? How can I perfect that V3? And I thought it'd be easy because I'd already made a V3, the geometry's there, but I just geeked out so much into how to put it together and not have a bunch of funky stuff again. So ideally people will be able to service that machine themselves pretty easy. Um, I wanted adjustable stroke, 
you know, on it that I want it to like, you can't go too far, too far back. You know, mm-hmm. you can turn it one way and it'll be the shortest stroke and it's going to be numbered and you go to the longest stroke. And when you get it, it's going to be set on number five, Right. <laughs> you know, and like, eh, here's a good starting point. It may be off like a couple of digits, but you, you notice variances in springs and stuff. You may be like run one at setting five and the other at setting three, but like overall, there's going to be a, a window where you can't go too long or can't go too short. Mm. Um, so that's been a kind of a fun offshoot because I was kind of at a stagnant point with my slider for a little bit. And then I really want to get on this V3 again. And that was seemed to be like the one that when I fix them, those, those machines are from 2015. Um, and those motors are from 2015 and it's a cheaper motor, but I hardly ever replace a motor. I'm, I'm replacing the machines are four years old and I replace the bearings and everything. And I don't replace the motor and wow. all the stuff that I'm fixing on it. I know what breaks and what doesn't break on that machine. And so I've solved that. Like I've solved the problem with like the stroke knob getting dented in or people making their stroke too long or people like not knowing how to set their impact screw and like all these little things I'm incorporating in into the remastered version. I have a way that's like it's going to be the motor's going to run more quiet. I mean, it's still going to be a loud machine. I like things that go boom, but it, yeah. it's going to be more precise sounding. Everything about it is just the most remastered thing I can come up with for the, I think one of the best Sidewinder platforms I've I've made. With like with like the allure, I think to a lot of people with rotaries is is that there there usually isn't much of a sound. And you making these machines was that ever like a thing that was like a hindrance, like oh, but they're too loud, or because you're kind of in a field of your own, you know, making these. No. Absolutely, like has there has it been hard to like? Have you ever wanted to dampen the sound down? Do you want to? When I try, like on my V6, I put the with the O rings on the armature right, bar, yeah. and I realized that like. I don't like it. I don't like the way it hits. Like when you don't have that solid smack, Absolutely. it it loses the magic. And I know like you can still do it, but that by that time you're just using a little bit of a better normal rotary to right. to line with. And it's I think for maybe for black and gray it'd be good because there's it's more passive. Yeah, and like I, I really like the Sidewinder tune for black and gray. I think it's it's a really good black and gray machine if you tune it right. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I I really feel like a solid metallic impact. Um, gives it that sharpness, that effortless off the tip thing. For some people who want to work in the bog and like kind of sink their machine in, yeah, it's, it's great, you know, put the O-rings on and, and right. do that. But um, I don't think I'm very scared of noise anymore. And I knew like, I think more people um, compliment the weight of the machine and the sound when mm. they get it um, versus like, I've had more people complain about how light my uh, machine is, like when I make an aluminum one mm-hmm. and they get it I'm like, oh shit, this is too light. And uh, it's too quiet. And um, right. so I kind of want to be like, you know, a high-end sports car. You want that exhaust. You want that. <sighs> and we have a Tesla, and I kind of get bored of driving it because I don't – I want that erotic, like, right. thunderous sound. Like, I don't – but then again, like, I don't like the sound of a Dodge, like, Charger, mm. you know, with a, with a V8, right. 500 horse, because it sounds like a, a – like a, a bunch of rocks in a can, you know, mm. but you sound, hear a Maserati and like, oh my God, this right. is the most gorgeous sound. I feel it. Cause I'm not like when a loud motorcycle or a car goes by, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. They're, they're doing that. I'm not like much into that, but like, but my machines, like I kind of take pride in the noise and I like, I like to crank it on and see the client and go, oh, am I cut out for this? Like, oh, and it's like, good you know that's like you need to be ready for this you know what i mean suck it yeah <laughs> you know but yeah I, I i like it like it's like it's it's making the it's it sounds like how it runs and i and, I, and, and like it just makes it makes sense and i think when i take out that element it, it feels like something is missing you know i don't really i don't want the machine to not vibrate or not like i, I want I want to feel it doing what it's doing so I can know what's happening while I'm yeah. doing it. You know, I want the feedback for sure. Yeah. I want to like, I want to feel, I want to feel the needles breaking the skin. Yeah. Some resistance, and like, right? Like yeah. with a lot of rotaries, what I hate about rotaries is it just like rubs like, and you have to like really bury it to get the needles to penetrate. Like push. Yeah. And so my, all of my, my endeavor is like getting it to pop. And I love the feel on the skin when it's like, it pops the skin and it's like, it's in there and it, yes. it's actually puncturing and mm-hmm. not like, I don't feel like I'm rubbing on the skin and smearing needles on somebody. Exactly. exactly. I wanted to get in and get under, you know, and, and do the, the job. And I want that sound. And, uh, it's, it's a romantic thing to me like that 
when that needles are breaking into the skin. Yeah, and you could like feel like I was like feeling the rever- reverberation of the skin on like on my stretching yeah. hand, and I could just feel it when I have used like rotaries like uh, like I think that don't have the hit. You know, mm. I, I don't really. I feel like I'm pretending the tattoo yeah. and I'm not like, okay, I'm just going to like do it and I wipe it and it's there, but it's just like, it's not only not satisfying, but it, I don't feel involved in the process. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I think that these like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't feel, it just doesn't feel correct to me. Yeah. You know? So I think that's the reason, the only reason I can run your machines is because their rotaries is rotation, but like, but it actually has that impact that other rotaries. It's not, not a rotary rotary. Yeah. It's a rotary cause it has a motor. Yeah. You know, but um, I'm definitely like a big part for me too was when I got into building machines because when I was doing coils, I was like, man, I'm not bringing anything new to the table, and all I'm doing is taking money from some other dude. You know, like I'm all I'm just I'm just another mouth to feed in this industry, and um, it's it's kind of fucked up. They're like somebody's already got this, and they're already they're not they're not busy enough already. I don't need to go in and take his job from him. Like mm. he's already got that, and and I can't do it better than him. So why do I want to why do I want to do that? Um, and you're also not going to make any money at it when everybody else makes the same thing, right? You know, and um, it's just taken from everyone and yeah. yourself, yeah, and, and, like it, everything. Um, by the time you're copying somebody else's thing and you can't do it as good as them, you're hurting me and hurting yourself because like you're you're already just like riding somebody else's coattails kind of a thing. You're not you're not doing anything to better the industry. Right. Um, so I kind of went into it like I'm not going to make something unless I have an improvement, unless I can make something better and provide something that's not already there. And so even if the machine's expensive, um, it's there's value in it, you know, because it does a da- It does a tat. You can't just go and go on a tat souls website and buy another, another vag tickler. That's going to do what, you know, right. What my machine does. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making something because it's not there. I'm not making something because, Oh yeah, I hear people like sliders or, Oh, drug shop's easy. I'll make one of those. And I'm like, no, I want to make the thing that's like said, couldn't be done. Like when, when I saw the thing, like I read this on this forum, the guy's like, Rotaries suck. Why do they suck? Because there's no give. There's no adjustable stroke. There's there's nothing. They don't. They can't line. <laughs> and what I, I got a sidewinder. Adjust. You know, it has give. It has impact. It has have a lot of things. Has that, adjustable that stroke. That day, and it yeah. and it can line better than any coil. Yeah. Like me to me. Like I don't know. We could. That's debatable. But like. To me, like I haven't lined with the coil that can do what the sidewinder can do, or at least the versatility, or the fact that that one sidewinder turn a stroke knob a couple clicks, and it's a completely different machine for a yes. different hand. So you can do singles, you can do fourteens, and you can just go a couple clicks on your stroke in in between tattoos and have a different one. Mm-hmm. And you don't have a one trick pony, you know. That's just oh, this this thing's good for my sevens, and this one's good for my fourteen liners, and I like this one when I'm tattooing a shin, and I like this one when right. with a bug pin seven. Yeah, and it's getting so like user friendly. I feel like when I first started buying your machines, um, I'd uh, watch your video over and over <laughs> again, and like, and I'd be listening for the wrong sound because my machine's a little bit louder, or or it's just it's just, and it, it, I was so confused by the whole thing. But but it seems like it's getting so much more streamlined, especially with the V3R, with like you want to put the numbers on it. You know what I yeah. mean? It's just like it's it's getting like I don't want to say dummy proof. Cause there's, there's some dummies still out need there. A li- yeah. I'm never, never like be surprised by somebody's stupidity. Right. <laughs> I said, uh, Jerry common thing. sense is not common at all. No, like what I, <laughs> what I thought was common. Like it used to be that I would send motors up to people. Yeah. So like this, the reason there's this guy, I don't want to say his name. You Fair. know who you are, Matt Carlo. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, he got one of my first mini crankers when I'm basically an apprentice machine builder. I'm just like, I'm so new to everything. I don't know what's going on. Right. Um, and he got the machine and about a month later he hits me up and he's like, Hey man, the motor went out on my machine. Mm-hmm. Um, can I get a new motor? I'm like, Oh shit. Okay. Fuck. I'm sorry, man. And I sent him a new motor. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, um, he's like, because this motor went out in a month and I, I do like the machine. I tattoo a lot. Can I get like five motors? And I'm like, Sure. I sold him five motors, you know, like at cost basically. And, and, um, uh, like a couple of years go by, I actually like fast forward a lot. He, cause he had several machines, but, um, like he hits me up like two years ago. So the, it, the machine is like four, four years old, five right. years old at the time. Uh-huh. 
and he goes, man, I need to get like 10 more motors. I don't know what the hell is wrong with this machine, but I think I need a new one or something. But like, this one's a lemon and like, it keeps breaking. And, um, I was like, I think there's something else going on. Why don't you just send it in? You know, cause he's like, he's saying, I have to replace a motor every month in this machine. And I only mm. get to do a couple tattoos with it before I have to put a new motor in. Yeah. Like, there's something going on. Those motors, typically the motor is the last thing to go bad in a machine. Right. I get it. And the, the bearing on the linkage was completely disintegrated. There was actually no bearing left. It, like the, the shield had even like broken and disintegrated. Everything was gone. Like, not a side bath? And is it, no. It, um, I think I had a batch of bearings back then that were, um, they, they weren't lubed. Like I bought them and they're high end bearings, but I think it slipped the past the lube line in the in the bearing oh. assembly plant, and um, so the bearing instantly dried up, and they just kept replacing motors because the bearing was bad. It was from that batch, and then some other stuff was like locking up, or you didn't have the motor set just right. And the mini cranker, you, it's a skosh and cunt hair machine, and I say that because like you got to move it a skosh and slide it over a cunt hair, and you got to get this and feel this, and when it feels like good, like there's not, nothing quantifiable, like you. When it feels like this, and there's just a little bit of resistance on that linkage, then you know it's good. Mm. And like I can't, how do I, how do I quantify? It's like I, I couldn't. So I couldn't. Like I can't really send a motor out when you have to be like you just kind of shift it. You got to kind of feel it. You actually got to make about 200 of them, and then you kind of get it down. You know. Mm. Um, but anyways, this dude, he's like reluctant. And he sends his machine in, and yeah, sure enough, the bearing was disintegrated. So I. Replace the motor. I replace the bearing. Replace all this, the stuff on it, and um, I charge them like sixty bucks or eighty bucks, whatever it was. You know, like I rebuilt the whole machine. But it's from from when I first started, and I've came so far since then. Well, I got this new batch of motors, and I thought I bought this whole about ten thousand motors that I thought, oh, these will be better ones. And like, because the brushes are different, they're not this precious metal. They're gonna be this carbon brush, but it's the same winding. But there's something off. I, I think I think there was no, like, the, the, it has a little sleeve bearing. And I think that there was no oil impregnated into it. Or there, there's very little lube that was impregnated mm. into the bearings. There's something wrong with this whole batch of motors that I bought. And I started putting them in for about a six-month period of time. I was using this motor and all my mini crankers. And this for this dude's bad luck. I replaced the motor with this other one and it only, it, it did last a year. I mean, that's, I mean, for, for the cost of that machine, like you, you got, you got, yeah. you made 50 grand off of that, off that machine, you know? Mm. Um, but anyways, he hits me up a year later after I rebuilt it once. Like, dude, you just rebuilt this thing last year and it's already fucked up again. I'm like, that's weird. Let me get it. And I, so I got it and, um, and I was like, Hey, uh, yeah, so I, did, I just replaced the motor. I got better motors now. Like, I had a bad batch of, of motors. They weren't like, they were, they met the demand of like what they say that motor can do. So it, it didn't fall short of what the expectation is. I just have a higher expectation for that motor. And mm. it just fell short of what the standard, the norm is. So I repaired it and I also replaced the linkage because he ran it hard enough. He wore out the linkage and, and stuff. So I, I, again, rebuilt the machine a year later. Cause it's also a machine that was like from my apprenticeship yeah. builder days. Like right. I, it's Stop not, a, it's shit. not a, it's not the wolf's well engineered thing. And it yeah. also wasn't the most, it wasn't a $700 machine either. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I already boxed it up and already mailed it out. Cause I just wanted to get it done and get it back to him. And this guy was like, I just text him like, Hey, I fixed your machine. I got a new motor and like this motor will actually hold up better. It's, it's a good and new linkage, everything. Um, send me 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. and give my paypal stuff and he goes excuse me dude that's fucking bullshit for the cost of that machine i shouldn't have to pay 50 dollars every year to get it fixed and i'm like for the cost of your car you like send your car in to get an oil change um right. every every six months you're paying like a hundred dollars to get the oil change in your car i have a, a little tattoo machine that's like shit breaks man like you actually ran it really hard because your linkage is all wore out so it's not like you and you're just so pissed it's like fuck you you're horrible i'm never buying your machines and like um i was like basically told me how much of a piece of shit and how much of a horrible businessman i was and i was like ripping them off and that my machine was garbage and i was like you know all that stemmed from his frustration with me sending him motors because he's kept fixing it wrong over and over again mm. and by the time that one little bad luck thing happened again he's just like you suck you know, and so I decided like I'm not sending motors out to people because they're gonna keep misdiagnosing things, and then they're just gonna hate me and hate my machines. And then it's like, um, 
I'd rather fix it right the first time and avoid as many emails as possible. Because mm. by the time I mail you a part, you're like, hey, I got this in and it's not right. Or the worst thing is I see on like Tattoo Get For Sale, like recently refurbished a new motor. And, like, and then like there's a linkage. It's all backwards because they did the repair themselves. Oh. And they got it and like, and then I get this machine back and it has a motor that I didn't sell. And it's like, yeah, I got this off tattoo gear. And it's like, oh, or like, or if they get it, like people would get the parts that I send them yeah. and they don't fix it right. And then they're embarrassed to tell me like I didn't get it right and they don't want to waste my time. Mm. So they just sell it as recently refurbished with new parts. Fuck, man. And so then if somebody gets this and then they're in Europe, right? And so then they have to mail it back to me and I'm not, I'm not fixing it for free. It's not my problem. By the time it's left the original owner, it's like. Yeah, it's not your responsibility. You don't, I don't even know what's been done to it. Right. Um, and I want to take care of the people who actually it's a bought something. dang old something. Stan Dubin now. I don't yeah. have this motor in yeah, there right now. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, long story short, um, I don't trust people to do maintenance on the machines yet. Mm. And But I am working on it. Like, I want it, by the time I really want to slow down, I want it to, like, be like Legos. My gift is, in. like, yeah, you can just pop this together. And I, I want to get better videos on my YouTube to, like, mm. really break it down and then have subtitles. And I'd like it to where you could, like, see the subtitles in Korean or German right. or in everything and all these different languages. And um, it almost comes full circle with, like, the coil machine that you were trying to have stuff bolt in and bolt out. And now it's, like, coming around to that's kind of the yeah. goal with these. Eventually, I just want, like, great tools that that you can use and you can service and you know, like you can, you can have this one machine and you know, every couple of years you need to spend like 50 bucks and some replacement parts and, right. and it's good to go and it's simple. And, um, with my new slider, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, cause I'm really starting to hone in on that. Like you can pop stuff out and replace things really easy. Um, mm-hmm. it's still not quite there and I'm pretty sure that somebody's going to like prove me wrong on how easy it is, but it's probably the easiest thing so far, like that it goes together more like a firearm or something where it just pops in and all this like click, 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 a right. couple screws. And, yeah, yeah, it was really cool seeing how like dialed in, like how well this stuff fits, like seeing you pop it together like that. And like there's, there's, there's great value in, in good machining and like, and that yeah. wizardry that, over that, there. That right there yeah. is why you're paying $750 yeah. for a machine and the constant, like constant development with the slider, like, I just now started showing it, but it's been almost a year that it's been, that I've been mm-hmm. working on it. And like, let me just back up here. Yeah. These are all slides that I've made for that slider that I've made for the slider, um, that I was trying different stuff and all these different slides, like one after another running it in the machine. Nope. Not that one. Nope. Not that like trying to accomplish something with this slide. Yeah. But that's just a, a small, lot of time and a lot of money. That's that. And uh, with my DMC and swing liner, I have a whole tub this big of different cams I made, like trying to make the cam a certain way with a certain shape um, just to get the effect that I'm looking for. And then I had to settle on something. And then when I sold the DMC, it's like, yeah, I kind of like the swing liner better. Mm. I just kind of like, because I don't like turn it up. I just don't want to turn it up. I want to run it at four and a half volts. And like, Turn it up to six. Like, oh, I'm going to tear somebody apart. Like, just, you say you tattoo fast, you're not going to tear them up. Just, yeah. it wants to run at six volts. Just tear my inbox apart. Turn that shit up, player. You got a new machine <laughs> for a reason because it could do something like, something is else. harder and faster. But yeah. now you're complaining because you want to run it slower and softer. Right. But you want it harder and faster. But you don't want to change your hand speed and you don't want to do anything different. Yeah. Um, but like, man. You're asking fuck, a question, but I don't want the answer. You know? Yeah. Like, I've, I've spent. I spent months making different cans to try to find that unicorn can. It's like, okay, this is the one that's best with this machine. Mm-hmm. And then somebody's like, yeah, like get on the forum. It's like one guy can have this huge voice, like a beacon on a, on a forum. Be like, yeah, I just kind of like the, the swing liner better. I kind of like this other thing. Or I like the V2 better. Like maybe they like with the side one, especially like, I like the V4 better. Like maybe it was just tuned different. And maybe you didn't understand this. The other thing is, especially with the V4, I was playing around with different cams and I kind of got off on like a different cam and different spring tension. Um, and so I kind of lost like what, what I really wanted that machine to be. Mm-hmm. And now fast forward, now when I do repairs on them, I put them back to like, I can make that machine badass. Just like the V3, when I get them back for repairs, I rebuild them, new cams, new springs, new, new spring tension, all this stuff. And 
this is good. Like it's yeah. it's it's not like I'm polishing a turd anymore. They're I'm, getting something I'm, better than what they yeah. bought. Yeah, and it should last new. a hell of a lot longer the next time around than what it did the first yeah. time around. Like the little stuff, like the vice sleeves, like improvements to the vice sleeve, improvements to like if you don't like something that I'm making, just wait three months. Right. <laughs> It'll be different. I'll yeah. you know I'll I'll figure it out for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it kind of takes making a thousand of something before you realize I should have done that different. Or on next time, next batch, next batch I do, I'm going to do it different. And I'm yeah. going to fix this problem or, you know, so it's not really a problem. It's just, it could be better. Yeah. Know? So like, so do you ever have like, does it ever haunt you with like, with how many machines are going out and how much innovation is happening in between and how many things that need to come back? The mountain of repair, <laughs> like how do you, what's your plan? How are you going to, fuck man, that's rough. I don't know. Well, you know, the, the thing is, is so... I have to tell myself, guy, you know? like it is, it's, and the fact that I've been making about a hundred machines a week for the past several years. And before yeah. that, like my, with my mini crankers, when it started at first, it was 10 a week and then 20 a week and then 30 and 40 and 50 and 60. And I remember fast forward a year from the first time I made a mini cranker where I was selling one every two months, the next May I sold 60 in a month and I was so busy. And then the next year I'm like 80 a month and and then like 80 a week, you know, it's right. just crazy. Right. And uh, I'm figuring out better ways to streamline the process. And I have a helper and I outsource like the machining and, and I have like a place that does the electroplating and I just streamline stuff like, you know, just only posting machines once a week so that I'm not always on my website. I'm not always entering stuff on a computer, you know, right, that, right. that definitely helps. It's not a, it's kind of a cool strategy, but it was oh, unintentional. It it, my intent wasn't to like make it to get people in a frenzy. It was, my intent was I don't want to post stuff on my website. I hate computers. I don't want to be on a fucking computer all the time. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely overwhelming um, to think that I'm the guy that has to repair all this stuff. And I have people who don't understand. Like, what if every tattoo you did? What if? What if you did a hundred tattoos a week, and just one of those people every week and you've been doing this for like five years, one a week demanded that you do a, a total re repair of their tattoo after they fell skateboarding and they want you to pay for their Uber ride to get to your shop. Um, and then everything and don't think that you should just do it for free. Like I'm a model and I make my money off my tattoos and I made a hundred thousand dollars this year modeling because of the cool tattoo you did on me. And I was skateboarding and I was out in the sun and I blistered it all up it's just a half sleeve. I mean, seriously, dude, you can charge me $50 to, yeah. to fix, <laughs> yeah. to fix my tattoo. Yeah. What about having a lifetime, lifetime repairs? Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the whole like lifetime warranty thing on tattoo machines was like when it was a coil and most of the time, like the guy maybe sold 20 a year, you know, right. Not the 20 scale. a year. And then it was like, mostly just had to turn a contact screw or, or put a new spring on it. But you know, like I'm, when I'm repairing a machine, I'm, putting about $40 in bearings and maybe a motor that maybe the motors like maybe up to 80 bucks now. And then like, um, all the shit an hour's worth of emails and shipping it to and from them. You know, it's, it adds up to where I'm not on one end. I got people pissed off that like this fucking dude, I spent all this money on this thing and now I have to fix it. And Mm. then, and then now I have to ship it and you're charging me like, like $85 for a mini cranker repair. Like, I'm pissed off that I have to spend the money and my time to fucking email you back and yeah, like them. I mean it it, it, it broke yeah. like they, they break you run the shit hard and like and it does this like um, I'm gonna take care of you if it's like if it's less than a year old but by the time it's a year like a lot of shit can happen to a complex mechanical device in one year and it's and it's just going to break something's going to go bad on it eventually yeah. ideally a machine should last like three or four years like I it seems that the people I know like on an average that that I know personally that I just don't know them because they're always breaking their machines. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them will have a machine for three or four years before I, I need to service it or, or something. And yeah. ideally a lot of them are like, oh, I'll just get a new one now. And I'll just kind of, you got a new model. I'm just going to still use this one as my backup, but I'm going to get a better, right. get a better one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you got the other people, which is admirable who will buy a machine from 2012, like the James Spooner guy you're talking, you know, him. yeah. And he still has a mini, like numbered, like, like number 85 yeah, he's mini running. cranker. And yeah. he still runs it and he sends it in. And it's like, hey, mind if I send all my other ones in? I'm like, I don't. But just so you know, 
if everybody did that, I wouldn't have time to make machines because I have to just fix broken tattoo machines. Yeah. Already I spend a one day every week is just doing repairs or like half a day is doing repairs. And I've kind of tried to like embrace it because I do like fixing stuff and like playing with old gems. Like I get and maybe it that's the reason why the V3R is coming into existence. It now. is. If, because... if I didn't do repairs, I would not be able to remaster that machine because yes. I wouldn't know what was wrong, what was breaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so every time it's like, I now like I really try to have a positive outlook on all the repairs I do. Is like this yeah. is the time to see it. And also, when I get an old machine back and it's gorgeous, and it's like. I don't do too many of the same finish ever. Like I do a run for like a while and then I get bored and I get an old machine back like, Oh man, I remember this. I remember that SpongeBob machine I made for that guy. (laughs) And like, I remember that, that deal or when we did this and, um, it's kind of fun to see my old, my old friends come back, you know? Right. I um, love that. But it's also overwhelming to think that what if like something's going to have to change. Like I, already like this this next year i'm gonna i plan on slowing my production down in half um Mm. because i'm not gonna be able to keep up and i don't want to hate what i do um Mm. but i also can't fix broken tattoo machines and every morning i answer 30 minutes to 45 minutes of of emails half of them are how do i get a machine hey bro you're all sold out like it's on the site it says on every page of the site when i post machines and the the time zone it's in (laughs) just 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 do that I, i like i'm too busy i can't answer everybody's email yeah. individually like it's just me like mm-hmm. well i'm a highly functioning business and i'm still the guy fixing every broken machine answering every single email related to a machine i forward the shipping stuff off to my wife but it seems hard to make that sustainable with it all just being you, you know? it's crazy and i'm trying to do my best but um i th- i think i'm gonna be able to say this by the time this video comes out but um my plan with the v3r is that workhorse irons is gonna i'm licensing them that they can make it and I'm also feel comfortable because it's, I've already remastered it. It's, it's very solid. It's a very solid machine and it's going to go together good. And all the instructions on how to tune it, it's all there online. And literally you turn it to number five, set your impact screw on the line, you know, on the, on the, on the frame. Mm-hmm. And it's good. It's so seamless. Like the, the assembly of it is really seamless and it's just going to go together well. And so they're going to start making it. And my machine shop is going to make the, um, it's still going to make it. I'm going to do all the quality control here. So all the parts are still being made in Kansas city. And then it's going to go up to them and they'll put them all together and sell them and distribute them, do the emails, do the maintenance. And then the emails itself is like, <sighs> like it's killing me. Like amazing. my days yeah. to retirement are measured in emails. Cause this yeah. doesn't work to me being in here is like, this is what I live for. Right. Emails is the only part of work of my day. It's like the having to talk. To, and I love, I, I like corresponding with people. But when you have to correspond with 50 people every morning about the same problem, and every mm-hmm. morning when you wake up, like imagine every morning you woke up to 50 emails about a touch-up. I love the tattoo. It's great. You didn't do anything wrong, but it is five years old. Yeah. And like, yeah, it's five years old. Five years old. Can you just can you just fix it up? Yeah. Like, how much is that going to cost? Fuck. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's that's like, rough. And I, I, it takes me just as long to rebuild and fix a new machine, like an old machine. It takes, it takes me probably twice as long sometimes to fix an old machine than to build a new one. Mm. Um, but I admire that people, I don't want to be a contribute to the throwaway society either. So it's a catch 22 one side. It sucks, but that's my medicine. It's like, I want to, my belief is that you should be able to get this fixed and I, I can be a good company that does that. The problem is, is that when you're a good company, you can't stay a good small company for very long because when you're a good small company, word gets around. And then all of a sudden you're busy and you're overwhelmed and you kind of become to where your clients are the worst part of your deal. Like right. the people that you love that pay your bills, you start to despise them because like, just leave me alone. Don't ask me for a fucking private. I know, I know we're friends, but unless you're here in person, please don't take right. my time up. And, Cause like, I'm a nice guy and like I, I, I try to accommodate my friends. You only have so much I know. time. And like I can't, like I got to stop what I'm doing. Like I got a million, I don't have enough time in my day already and literally i watch the clock not to see what time i'm going to be done but to see how much more time i have in my day because like i'm still trying to get stuff accomplished and um when i have to stop and spend another hour of my time to send text messages to this dude back and forth about like this machine and this to find out oh i actually gotta wait three more weeks i'm like all right, there goes an hour of my of my life that right. I, I could have actually made that new slide because I was on that thing and I was trying to do it. And now I was like not fresh in my head and now I gotta kind of start over because mm. I had to stop my day an hour short. 
because I was trying to accommodate an old friend. Right. Um, if you're a friend of mine, just respect my time. Yeah. Right? Don't try to like get something for free. Oh, I know Dan. Like, it's just, I'll to text Dan Cuban. <laughs> Yo, man. <laughs> like uh, another guy was like, he's cool, nice guy and stuff. But he kind of like, seemed like he wanted to name drop me. Mm. And like, I was selling machines because he, for his whole shop, he'd buy like five machines at a time or something. And I was like, you're going to buy five machines. It's worth my while. Like I can put one order together. Usually they don't care. Like five machines, just nothing too flashy or do you got anything bright or, you know, right. something like that. Not like I want the black nickel with red hardware and I want, you know, like, um, right. But, um, by the time he called me on the phone, he was saying, yeah, man, I was at a convention. People were like, how do you even get those? Like, oh, dude, I just call them up and you just mills me. It's like, that's it. No more. And I hope you tell everybody that I don't sell you machines directly because everybody starts expecting that. They're like, hey, man, this so-and-so um, said he got this from you and I could just call you and, and, mm. and get something. And I'm like, fuck, now everybody, everybody expects this from me and I can't, I can't run my business effectively now. It's like, I don't want to hire more people. Right. I just got rid of my employee because... We want to just consolidate. I want to make less product, but consolidate everything so I'm more involved with every step and be more more intimate with with what yeah, I'm doing. Yeah, you're saying you want to do like more small batch stuff. Yeah, that's the next the next endeavor as I do stuff with Workhorse. I want to just focus on fun, small batch things. And I'm still doing the due diligence. Like you're going to buy a machine. It's not going to be like, it might work. Like I've... I'm pretty sure I've, you you can rest assured I probably tattooed with it for six months, like variations. I've been working on something for about six months, but I just want to make like 200, 250 of something. Yeah. Put them out there. Like once I make the slider, I'm going to plan on making about a hundred of them, 150 of them. I'm just going to put them on my site. Get them when you can. Um, I'm going to put them up there. And what I thought about doing is actually having it to where you can say, pick from five different finishes and a couple different side plates and you can kind of configure it and the price is going to be higher, but you'll get exactly what you wanted. And hopefully with the price being higher and the fact that you got exactly what you wanted, you won't sell it. It won't be a frivolous buy. Like I'm actually paying, I'm committing to this. I'm going to pay some money and I'm going to get the exact finish I want. Mm. And I'm not going to just flip it. Um, just, just to make a hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, is it hard for you to find like, like the flattery in your machines, like being so valuable because you're so emotionally attached. So you get hurt when someone like kind of gets rid of it or moves on. I, I do. And I just try to accept it. And it's like, it's just life. Right. And they don't see it. But, um, I guess now, like I said, I have a price for my machine that I think, I still think that there's more value. There's obviously it's more valuable than what I'm selling it for because right. people can sell a used machine and never even lose money. If anything, they sometimes make money off of it. If mm -hmm. they auction it on eBay, um, I try to put more value into it than what I even sell. Um, but when I, but at the same time, it's like, that's what I sold it for. If, if you're going to sell it, I mean, I guess if you make a profit in a way, it legitimizes my product that much. It does. It's actually better for business when people scalp it and make it high. At the same time, the other half of me is the emotional side. That's not just money and business side. And it's like, but, but I, I made that for you. Uh, you know, like I, yeah. that's like, like it's almost still like I feel like it's a gift, you know, like enjoy this. It's like this is my my child. Like you you're getting a piece of my heart, you know, a piece of my soul with with that machine. And then like when I see it as a commodity, like bought and sold and traded and flipped, it it hurts because what I'm doing, I'm not doing for the money. I'm doing it for a deeper a deeper like to 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 fill a void in my in my in my soul kind of, yeah. you know. And uh to see it as just a commodity is kind of it's it's kind of like it's kind of like getting fucked in the ass and not getting a reach around or something, <laughs> you know? Like it's like, ah, damn it! Like, <laughs> um, but uh, I just try to put that out. What what really started pissing me off was when I'd hook somebody up on something and I make it exactly how they wanted mm. and go out of my way and then hook them up because they were like locals or a friend, and then to find out that they auctioned it on ebay and made 200 dollars off me hooking them up because like hey yeah i think you're really gonna like this and yeah. i think because you love machines this is gonna be really special and i'm not gonna make many of them mm. and because you're local i want to give you this price and then to find out you auctioned it off mm. a week after you got it just because you knew it was in high demand and it's just like fuck man like i know like i don't care if 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 somebody was to just like buy it off my site and then they flipped it but by the time you wasted my time 
and got me to do something for you to stop what I'm doing and to spend more time just with you instead of with the whole community of tattooing mm. it's getting kicked in the balls for yeah. sure like and it, it is a big insult um so I don't even follow tattoo gear for sale because I don't want to get caught in the the, mm. the drama I don't it's I don't want to see it because I don't want to see yeah. it. I don't even want to see the the tattoo machine forums. I don't want to see people. I don't. I want it's to like not want to watch the news. Like it's not. Even I don't want to be like this. Is more like this very like close to me, and mm. like I do stuff. And um, if I hear somebody critique something every once in a while, it's good. Like I can actually set them straight. Like actually no. And if you actually just do this, it's going to be different. Kind of like with your coil, and you're like, oh, you did, you made that adjustment. It's not. Oh, just turn up the volts, just point three volts. Yeah, it's like, and, bing, there it is. Yeah, there it is, you know. But um, without understanding the full spectrum of what, what you got, um, um, yeah. <laughs> Off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with that, so I remember we were talking on the phone prior, you know, and I know you're afraid of like, oh, we, has, we talked on the phone for a few hours, you yeah. know. And it's like, oh, man, I feel like we're going to be doing it all over again. And we're not touching on a lot of new things. But one thing that I want to like revisit. Black Santa? Wh- no. No, <laughs> no was, was the idea of, I think, I don't know if we were talking about like the magic of tattooing and trying to like, try to describe what that is. And, and I think like, I was trying to give you the credit due, like maybe it's too humble, but you will have an idea and some it'll just work. And then and like explain explain that with with them with the magic with what like the idea comes and it goes and chasing uh, yeah. it and such. Um, so uh, some of the times the best ideas I have it just like it just hits me and like to the point that I feel like like we're just like little um, a receiver They're like a satellite out there sitting sending a transmission and you're kind of I feel like in a way there's a stream of consciousness like the Tao you know is like a stream of consciousness and other people are tapped into this like I feel like Josh Bowers another builder I feel he's kind of we're tapped in the same stream of consciousness the only thing is is because I always knew I wanted to work with metal and stuff I took the steps early on in life to learn about engineering and learn like machining and like really be very proactive early on to like I can make anything I can think of right. within reason. I can, especially with this mill, I can make anything. I'm like unstoppable now. Like I, yeah, it's like I you always have these ideas and, the, and, the work, and I can they make come it. to fruition, but yeah, you can go and make and other people idea. have those same ideas, but they don't have the machining experience. Mm. And at this point it's like, man, like it gets to be a lot by the time you have to invest in, in a $200,000 piece of equipment to make this stuff. But it was just, for me, it's just baby steps. But to get back to it, there's definitely like, a lot of us are, I think I'm tapped. I feel like sometimes I can like relax my brain enough and it'll tap into a stream of consciousness. And I feel like the world's wisdom, it's already been, it's already there. Everything already exists that ever will exist. I believe that it's already there. It's already a possibility. And, um, it's just a matter of tapping into it and materializing that, like whether it's in another dimension, like a fourth dimension or Mm -hmm. what. But I mean, there's sort of think that there's more than there's, there's now a fourth dimension and a fifth dimension that are layer after layer after layer. Like yeah. there has to be world knowledge, like not world, um, universal, like, like everything's already been thought. It's, it's already Therefore there. It could already you, just, be done. you just got to find it. You know, it's already exists. And like, I think I get this idea and I'll just have an epiphany. It's like boom, instant download. And I just hit it. Like my Wi-Fi signal is turned on, right. you know, hit a good Wi-Fi thing and everybody yeah. else turned theirs off. And I'm like, Oh shit. Yeah. And I'll, sometimes it'll flood out with a whole bunch of, of stuff will come out. But like with my, um, sometimes like when, when I make like say the mini cranker, I made a couple bars, the idea just hit me. And then I went down and just made it. And with a sidewinder, I had the idea. I had an idea originally. And then I, I I didn't have the equipment and then fast forward and I had a mill and I had a lathe and I could make everything. And then I was able to revisit it and reconfigure how my original sidewinder was. I made a sidewinder like 12 years ago and I never showed anybody, but it was also didn't, it was, it was the motors off to the side and it had the idea with the springs and stuff, mm-hmm. but it wasn't the same, but no, like I've gotten stuff where I just nailed it first try. Like I hit it and then I got it. And then like, now I want to quantify it. And by the time I go to quantify it, I lost something and I had it It was here and it's gone. And, and then it's there all along and it's like, it again, gets away. And, um, um, so elusive. So elusive. (laughs) elusive. 
We wrote, wrote a song about it. it was, Dude, would you be down to play it? Yeah, yeah. I all, right, all right, when we're done with this, we're we'll, done. we'll end it with that. Yeah. That'd be so cool. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just like sometimes it's there, and by the time I try to wrangle the unicorn, like the unicorn will show his face. I'll let you touch my mane. <laughs> yeah. and like, you touched my mane, and now you know I exist, and now I'm going to leave you. Poof, and um, I feel like it's a very divine thing. What the, the thing I'm on is in a way is like doing the Lord's work, whatever the, whatever the Lord is. It's the, to me, it's the benevolent energy in the world. And there's mm. something that I feel like we're more than, we're more than this. Like our souls lived a thousand lives. Our soul has been around forever. And there's something to, we do to feed our soul and to grow, to grow on a higher level than what we know is a physical, our physical self. And I can kind of do that in tattoo machines. And it sounds, maybe it sounds stupid, especially to some, somebody who just views tattooing as like a scumbag um, industry or whatever. Um, there's a lot of love in it, you know? And uh, you can just take this thing and I can treat people good and I can make this thing and, and have an idea and materialize ideas and abstract thoughts and like create things. And um, it's, it's a very fulfilling thing. And people say, like, well, why don't you develop medical equipment? Like, I'm not a doctor. I yeah. don't know. Like, you know. A tattoo or... why, why don't you, you want me to, like, I could get Geo's, Geo's home <laughs> medical heart transplant kit and maybe start right. finding better ways to make electric scalpels. I don't yeah. know. But, uh, no, like, I can make the same difference. The same, like, on a higher echelon. Like, I think in the, in the grand scheme of, like, the universe, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or you're a tattoo artist is how you conduct your life and how you're actually performing your task that you can kind of grow like on a, on a, on a higher level and you can like attain. I think we're on a, on a mission like to become a, a, at a higher level of conscious with every life, you know, with every, you, with your existence and, and su- there's certain significant stages in your life where this is a crossroads and I have a choice to go this way or that way. And those are like those key decisions, like, and you can choose to move in this direction or whatever. But um, I guess what I was saying is that unicorn will just show me, like, he'll let me know that, um, that he's there. Like, right. this is there and this is real and you can have it. And then it's like, how hard do you want to work, bitch? Mm. And sometimes the stuff, like with my slider, for example, and this happens with almost every machine, like I put constraints, like how I want to do it. And I go in like, okay, I want it to run standard needles. I want it to run cartridges. I don't want a bunch of adjustments. I don't want springs in it anymore. I don't, I don't want a car. Like I want it to have two different hits and I want all this stuff. So I got it to where you can control this, your rubber band can make act like a spring and control mm. the hit with a rubber band. And, so um, direction, yeah. yeah. And so you can do this, the, the, the slides made in a way to where one way it's a little bit more passive and the other way it's a little bit sharper. Um, so I can use cartridges, standards and everything, but, I couldn't figure out how to do it without having a spring. And I didn't want a spring in there because if people service their machine, you can just undo these rails and pull the whole mechanism apart. Mm. And I didn't want it to where they lose a spring and it gets broken when you jam it back in. always brand new. I just wanted it to where it was just simple and user-friendly. And again, like something that the customer can have and have some replacement parts and fully service it. Um, But I got to where I about gave up. Like, I can't do it. I can't. I guess it's just going to be standard needles. I can't make it. I can't make it um, for both. Mm. And then, like, the good, the powers that be were like, okay, we'll give you this. We'll give you this other little nippet, you know, that you can and it have. it just worked when you tried you just, to. Like, it'll just hit me. Like, I was, but it's usually by the time I, I've decided I've given up given and up, I, yeah. I quit, I'm just not going to be able to get it like I thought I would. And I just get bummed. And I'll sit there and I feel like this like warm tingly kind of come over and it's like, we got you, you know, Mm -hmm. we'll we'll let you, you worked hard enough now. I just wanted to see that you would work for this, you know, and everything has been like, I get it like right off the bat. I usually nail it. And then after that, and I'll feel it and I'll work and I can even do a tattoo with it. Holy shit. I just created the thing. And then the next day I go in and like, I fuck, I'm not going to make this better. I'm going to change this and change that. And like, fuck, I go and tattoo with it again. Like this sucks. And then I get into that tattoo. The only reason I want to do that tattoo was to use that. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, this sucks. Like it's ruined. Like my whole day is, my whole week is ruined. (laughs) And like, I'll come home and like, it's a heavy drinking night tonight. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) It's a heavy drinking night. It's great too. Like, hell yeah, I did it. Celebrate. (laughs) Um, No, uh, (laughs) I like to drink. 
<laughs> no, uh, but uh, but yeah, it can be, definitely my tattooing experiences are either make or break, um, and I can be, get really bummed. Or most of the time, I'll go and tattoo and instantly come into the shop and like turn on my mill, try something, or oh. I get my sketchbook out. And I'm like, okay, this is like that, and I think if it was just a little bit different. If I get the hit just a little bit sharper or if I shift mm. this over just a little bit, I think I can get what I want. And um, it's so fun. Like tattooing is so fun because it's all like it's a whole complete marriage of my development in here and my development tattooing and then combining all of them. Yeah. Um, like you made a tattoo. Like you made <laughs> that machine to make that tattoo. That's yeah. got to feel awesome. Yeah. Hey, what's that? Um, you know, the, the movie Just Go With It. I remember you know, the Adam name. Sandler and like the guy with the, um, <laughs> he's like, she's like the Devlin girl. She's like, her boyfriend is like, um, uh, he says that he made all his money off in, uh, inventing the iPod. Oh, okay. And then, um, and then he answers his phone right out to dinner and it says like, I, I'm in, or I, he has some stupid thing he says. And then Adam Sandler says, um, that's like, I can't believe that just happened. It's kind of like. Dr. Kaborki and killing himself, <laughs> you know, or something like how he said that when we were wanting to get a t- tattoo of a sidewinder, I start to think about that. Like, that's like that guy, like, like, uh, the sidewinder guy doing a sidewinder, even though if you really want that more than the rat, I'll totally, I'll totally do a sidewinder. But I, yeah. I do feel a little bit like it, on a very small thing. I kind of think in the back of my head, I think of like, um, a Cuban making a Cuban on a Cuban uh, is like some like <laughs> the, the, the thing like Dan Cuban using a Dan Cuban sidewinder making a Dan Cuban. It could be like a meme right there. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see the one that Troy uh, made? I reposted on my site where like the guy who the guy who copied the guy who copied the guy who copied Dan Cuban and it's like, <laughs> it's like a recip- and like the, the little Asian girl wearing this funky cat thing just <laughs> starts to go on the butt and the music changes. She goes and then stops and it just keeps like reciprocating. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Anyway, where well, I think we? I think we should <laughs> I think we should end this there. And I think that I think that that song that you wrote, like I think it it makes sense of this conversation. It's like a really good end cap. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's do it. It's like a yeah. It was it.